Hey folks, Randy Newberg here. You are listening to another installment, another episode of Leopold's Hunt Talk Radio. This time recorded from the wild, wet, snowy Henry Mountains, bison infested Henry Mountains of U- South Central. Yeah, South Central Utah. Yep, I am one of those lucky non residents. In fact, there were two non resident archery bison tags, and I drew one of them this year. And we're going to do a podcast here, waiting out a rainstorm before we get to the serious business of, spoiler alert, processing a bison. And uh, before we do that, we got to talk about all these great sponsors that make this podcast possible. Uh, Leupold Optics, obviously, That's why we call it Leopold's Hunt Talk Radios. They are the sponsor of everything we do. They support us. They support public lands. They support hunting in in just the greatest way that I I can think of. On this hunt, I was out here trying out the brand new version of spotting scopes they have. Uh, They're coming out, I think, later this month. So go to Leopold.com and uh, if you can, support them because... I can trust, you can trust when I say they are supporting us in many big ways. Great optics company, just a great company in general. Uh, Orion Coolers, I'm looking out the window where we're at here. We're actually cheating. Our buddy Ray, who's going to be on this podcast, brought his uh, travel trailer. So I look out the window of his trailer and I see four Orion Coolers out there that have more miles on them than most vehicles. Uh, Those coolers have traveled here, there, and everywhere, and they have, well, they continue to do their job marvelously well. Go to oriancoolers.com, use promo code Randy, and when you do, they're going to give you this really cool tumbler like Marcus is drinking his coffee out of right over here, and uh, you'll get that just for using promo code Randy. And some of you might be wondering, oh, Newberg, how did you draw this non-resident archery bison tag. Newberg, how did you draw blah, blah, blah? Well, you folks who wonder how we draw these tags for our show, I've said it time and time again. There's this group called GoHunt.com, and they have this insider program. So it's just everything I need to research units. And I'm talking about draw odds, unit explanations, public land versus private land, trophy potential, historical draw odds. It just, there's so much information in that insider all in one place. What used to be file cabinets full of research information, now I have at my fingertips. And here's the good deal right now. That until October 31st of 2018, if you go out to this website, now you got to use the slash Randy at the end. So gohunt.com forward slash Randy, you're going to get a 30 day free trial. So if you sign up on October 30th until about November 29th, you get 30 days of free trial of the Go Hunt Insider. Now, here's the other thing. Everybody who signs up using that URL, gohunt.com forward slash Randy, all of you who enter and sign up will be in a drawing for a pair of brand new BX5 binos binoculars, the new highest end binocular Leupold has, the BX5. All of you will be in a drawing for that, and the winner is going to be chosen by the guys at GoHunt on November 1st. So there you have it, folks. Chance to use this amazing service, and win a pair of binoculars. Last but never least is onxmaps.com. Um, we saw a herd of bison yesterday that if it wasn't for our onx, we might have made a mistake because they were on private land. And it's so easy to know exactly where you are, where you can go, and where the animals are with the whole onx system. Uh, Again, go there, use promo code Randy, go to onyxmaps.com, use promo code Randy, and save 20%. Whatever you buy in their, of their app products, save 20%. But here's the other cool deal. If you go out there, you're going to see all the details about how you can win an elk hunt with me for 2019. Yeah, somebody is going on a five-day, full-expense-paid, everything elk hunt in the fall of 2019. 
Go to onxmaps.com and you will find out the details. We're drawing the winner at the Las Vegas, in Las Vegas, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation has the Hunter and Outdoor Christmas early week. Uh, I think this year is December 7th or 8th, something like that. Well, that's when we're going to draw the winner. It's Onyx and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation are paying all the costs for me to take somebody to film you, loan you all of our equipment to use. Well, during the hunt, you just show up and hopefully you're going to get a really nice elk. And now with all that out of the way, we have four guests to go with three other microphones. So our old regulars, Marcus and Dan, the two camera guys, have decided they're going to share a mic that if either of them have anything worthy to contribute, that they're going to just push the other guy aside and steal the headset. Also with me, I asked for introductions of how these guys want introduced, and they're being modest. They're, they're some of the greatest guys. Uh, if you hang out on our Hunt Talk forum, go to hunttalk.com, you'll see some guys that, uh, I think, JR, you just go by JR Young out there, right? Mm-hmm. And so he's easy to find. And then we have EOD Ray, Ray White, who's out there. And that's how I met these guys is through the Hunt Talk forum. And not, no, it's not an online dating forum. It's a hunting forum, okay? You got to be careful when you say, oh, I met him online. They're like, oh, man, <laughs> don't know about this guy. But JR and Ray, when they found out we were going to be here in the Henry Mountain, they said, man, I'd sure like in on some of that. I said, well, I'd sure like to have you there. Because Ray is, I think his next calling is to be either a comedian a storyteller, or possibly he could have his own TV show. And JR, his, it might even be his current calling, is Wild Game Chef. So as quick as I click this button, everybody is going to be dialed into this podcast and you're going to hear a discussion about hunting bison in the miserable weather we have found here in the Henry Mountains of Utah. Hold on just a second. Well, folks, I told you that we were going to have a really cool podcast here because we have a really cool camp in a really cool place hunting a really cool species. About the only non-cool thing about it is your host of this podcast, but it, it just you're going to have to deal with it. So, JR, Ray, welcome to Hunt Talk Radio. Thank you. Awesome to be here. Yeah, JR, you've been on a time before, haven't you? I've been on twice. Yeah. Yeah. Man, you, you might find some better content. <laughs> have me on three times. Well, <laughs> I, I have yet to find a better cook out in camp, so you got that going for you, even if your modesty doesn't allow you to say you're much of a podcast guest. I suspect that Ray would vouch for your uh, culinary skills over a campfire. I would. Absolutely. I will gain 10 pounds, even though I'm burning however many calories a day. <laughs> uh, it was a phenomenal stuff you've been cooking here. I, I almost feel bad that I, I hope you enjoy cooking because I yeah I I'd love to cook it's just it's just fun I mean, okay that's, that's a that's a big component of it it's a it's a lot of fun for me and the way this hunt is set up and it's it's a it's a camp hunt it's not a backpack hunt so it's it affords that opportunity to be able to to be able to cook to cook well and so if you've got if you have the facilities and the opportunity uh, the key is just trying to make good food as as low maintenance as possible because you can easily take it too far but you know you have good cooking facilities but you still but cleaning's a little bit more challenging so yeah. try and get as close to one pot as you can and make it easy but you know it's still important to have good food he loves to cook and we love to eat it's a marriage made in hunter <laughs> heaven <laughs> uh, and uh, just in case anyone's wondering jr brought a box of chocolate mint dilly bars i that gives him an open invitation to my camp anytime anywhere we'll just boot someone else out if you show up we've finished eating that awesome meal and we're sitting around the campfire and i look over and there's jr and he's munching on a dilly bar and i'm like is that a dilly bar (laughs) (laughs) flipping dilly bar it's like okay and then we all had dilly bars we all had dilly bars and then i see you had that one remaining dilly bar last night yeah sorry i just no you deserve it i mean it came in a box of six and there's five of us yeah the guy the guy who brings them definitely gets to double down so 
do we want to get into bison hunting first, or do we just want to talk about all the great food we've been eating? Can't go wrong either way. Yeah. Uh, we, maybe oh. we better get into bison. Just we so got to leave with under- the bison hunting to come full circle to what we were eating. That's true. You think night. so, Dan? Mm-hmm. Because we were eating before we lucked out and killed the bison. Spoiler alert. Yeah, but we were eating bison after we killed the bison. All right. But now it's out there. So yeah. All right, it's there. So we'll talk about bison, specifically the Henry Mountains of southern Utah, south central Utah. They peak out. Mount Ellen is what, 11,400 something? 11 and change. Yeah. Bison that live like mountain goats. Yeah. When you call. 1,200 pound mountain goats. <laughs> <laughs> when Randy uh, sent me a message and he's talking about the hunt, and he's like, it's a bison hunt, and I just finished a elk hunt, which was pretty hard on me. And uh, I thought, oh, bison. No hills there. We'll be out in the plains, and <laughs> I, I can handle that. And then I get out here, and yeah, they're living like mountain goats. I'm like, oh, I wasn't quite expecting that. I <laughs> hope it I'm is, not too big an anchor on this trip. <laughs> uh, it is amazing to glass up on the tops of the ridges, the very crest of the ridges, and there are bull bison bedded like like mountain goats would. Just silhouetted right on the very top. It, on the standing sideways on it and I'm like I yeah. just I didn't know they did that yeah that was amazing but most people think of the Henry Mountains of Utah they think of big mule deer and I've seen a ton of mule deer I haven't seen a big one of any uh-huh. no I've like definitely it. seen a ton of mule deer I mean every, everywhere we've gone there's been, there's been mule deer there's there's a lot of them here you know the big guys are out yeah hanging out there somewhere I'd, I'd hope to be able to catch a glimpse of one but yeah Come November. Yeah, we're kind of socked in now, so even if you wanted to go out and try and find one, it's yeah, foggy we, and rainy and snowy. and Yeah, we have visibility of about 100 yards right now, and it's raining, trying to snow, because we're at 90... And did anyone look at the elevation at we're camp? At 80, we're at 83.14. 83 90. here? We're well? at camp. Oh, at camp? Oh, okay. At camp. Oh, that glassing spot we were at yesterday was ninety four mm-hmm. fifty yep. or something like yeah. that. So we only had two thousand vertical to go. <laughs> yeah, which was uh, thankfully not required. Yeah, ninety ninety two was the glassing spot. Okay, and you're looking at you got your on X on your phone. I'm looking right here at on X. See there you go, Downloaded folks. Downloaded my maps. Know you, exactly where we're at. Yeah, use promo code Randy and save yourself twenty percent on that to service Jr. is looking at right Off there. Off grid, on grid. Anytime you. I'm online shopping um, and it asks for a promo code, I just enter Randy just to see. If <laughs> <laughs> you know that's funny. Sitka called me the other day and said, "Are you giving people a promo code for us?" I said, "No, no, not at all. Why?" Well, we've got all these people calling in saying, I want to use promo code Randy. <laughs> like, so, folks, <laughs> disclaimer, there's no promo code. Oh, the same with the Elk Foundation. They called me and said, wait, wait, what's the deal with the promo code Randy thing? I said, what, what do you mean? Well, we got a bunch of people called in. They're being new members. They want to use promo code Randy. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Does right, Loopold do that? Do they get a lot of Randy promo codes? Who? Loopold. I don't people know. People are always commenting. Loophole, here, promo code Randy works in a few places. On X, Go Hunt, and Orion Coolers. Well, people are always commenting that they oh, want one for loophole. And there's get, get oh, oh, like right. It also works at Rocky, Ma- Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls, too. So if you go out to Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls and use promo code Randy, they'll give you a discount also. Even though they're not involved in the podcast, they're involved in all our other platforms. I better throw that one out there. So, uh, how'd we get onto that tent? Oh, because uh, JR because said he is on Amazon.com he, trying he to use them, promo yeah. code Randy. But, uh, yeah, we we may as well just talk about the hunt and how it happened, and then we can get into all the details and history of everything. Well, Marcus is over there downloading footage of the kill shot. So, we're all distracted right now because, yeah, turn the other way. Well, and, I wouldn't uh, mind talking about how beautiful these mountains are i haven't been out here before yeah and that first morning when we set up on that plateau and we started to glass the mountains and the sun started to hit all those mesas and plateaus out there it was breathtaking i just it's one of the most beautiful places on earth you just take it in and it's gorgeous yeah 
you were talking about when you look west over there to mm -hmm. Capitol Reef National As Park. As the sun came up and it began oh, to yeah. make them just look white. Reds and, and oranges and purples real. and whites, uh, just the bands in those cliffs. And I, I think that's one of the coolest things driving out here is you're in very classic four corners, sandstone, you know, very mm -hmm. red rock type country. And then all of a sudden, there's this there's this mountain range that just kind of jets out out of out of out of nowhere. I mean, maybe not out of nowhere, but it just jets out, and it's and it's in total contrast to what's around you. Yeah. And so you're up here at you know eighty five. 9,000 easily. I mean, there's, you know, there's a road over a pass that clears 10,000 and you look around you and it's just that classic Southern four corners that, that just surrounds you. But here you are up in the Ponderosa pine and you climb up and there's some oak brush and, and a ton of sage. And it's, it's, it's just yeah. such a stark contrast, but it's surrounded by this, this desert. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really, it's really, really cool. I mean, I've never, I've always heard of the Henry's um, but never, never seen him, and it really is a really cool, special place. Yeah. Well, the bison must have thought the same thing because in 1941, when they brought these bison, this herd from Yellowstone National Park, they released them out in some of this sage, flat desert country, and they migrated up here, and they just just kind of struck out and made a living up here, and that's. They said, well, if the bison want to live in the mountain, well, that's where we'll have them. So that's how that herd got established here. They've augmented it a few times. But it's uh, genetically pure, free range, which we found out. They don't just stand around and mm -mm. say, oh, shoot me. It's, uh, and disease-free. So the Yellowstone herd, those who watch our platforms know that I had a Montana bison tag in 2013. That Yellowstone herd gets called hard by the tribes, by resident hunters, and by the Department of Livestock in Montana because of a disease called brucellosis. And this herd here does not have brucellosis. There's only a few herds in the country that don't have brucellosis, and this is one of them. So, I think and, they, they, and they're testing them constantly still. Yeah, I had to, when I shot mine, you guys saw me grab those two little, I'll call them test tubes, but I don't know what they're yeah, called, and fill them up with blood. There was plenty of blood to, to put in there. Um, a bison, I wonder how many gallons of blood a bison must have in its body, something that huge. Yeah, on that, Marcus. <laughs> oh, better if we had good good internet reception. We could, yeah, we that, could be that's one thing. Ourselves here. If you're in the Henrys, don't plan on using Google to be your friend. Nope. You're, you may as well stand outside and yell at that point. The only but, thing these buffalo suffer from is hustleosis because you hit them and they're gone for miles and you're not, <laughs> you're not catching them. <laughs> yeah. Well, we we saw a lot of bison on this hunt. Mm -hmm. A lot. I I think. I bet you the first day we saw close to. 70 yeah probably. between all mm -hmm. those those three three four groups there was Except. there was definitely no challenge of, of well i say the first day we saw a lot right. the second day we saw f far fewer because yeah. they got bumped um, so and much we, and we we definitely watched it was it three groups head low yeah from where we were at on that first day and so how long they're going to stay down there nobody knows i mean yeah. Seem like a lot of hunters were probably chasing them down there, and they end up there. You know, they're just gonna keep kind of fluidly moving. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's still a good number of bison way up high. Yesterday, before we spotted some, we you know that we spotted some way over high up on a peak that we were debating as to could we get to them? How could we get to them? They're out in the open. There's nothing to hide us and can yeah. you get into, can you get into bow range, but three great big bulls, you know, standing out in, you know, what I'd call no man's land that yeah. it'd be impossible to try and get on, but they're not hard to spot. That's, no. that's for sure. They're a, they're a big dark, <laughs> they're a big dark mass. They, they pop out pretty well. Yeah. And there was a circus clown show of ATVs and hunters bouncing all around. Wow. Everywhere, I've never seen so much activity as far as hunters in an area, yeah. and it it's, was crazy. There, there's some places where that's the the I'll call it group hunting. I don't call it party hunting because that assumes multiple people trying to fill the same tag. But Utah, I've had deer tag here, bison tag here, pronghorn tag, and an elk tag, and uh, one dynamic is that. For each tag holder, there's 
four to eight other people mm -hmm. buzzing around the woods, spotting, you know, that here radios are legal. So there's a lot of radio communication. I don't even own a radio. So I, it, it always takes me that pretty much half a day to adjust to, oh yeah, this is a really busy hunt because there's only 20 tags. You're thinking, well, there's going to be 20 guys, you know, 20 parties out there. And then one party splits out into six parties. It's like, whoa. Mm -hmm. Every knob, every place, every trail, every road has multiple ATVs running up and down there. And we show up, we don't have an ATV. We got two pickup, three pickup trucks and four llamas. No radios. And no radios. And, that, and mean, no that, cell that, reception, so you couldn't send them a text either. <laughs> <laughs> even though you tried. <laughs> that, that first, I mean, that, that first day is, you know, especially there was more groups up high and exposed to where you could see them. Yeah. I mean, you could almost just watch the radio communication of mm -hmm. guys running around and all of a sudden either hustling to their to their ride or turning around real quick or making a quick dash and you can tell that they're just that everybody's getting communicated with and it's it's just such a weird there's a master spotter that will call to the transporter that will get them somewhere <laughs> and drop them off and then <laughs> they missed them okay uh, go meet at the truck and we'll hustle you over here because this is where it's at now and yeah. very coordinated chaos it, it, yeah. it is it, it's it's for it's foreign but i mean that's the, those right. are those are the those are the utah rules and right those are yeah. you know each of these circumstances depending uh, you know you look throughout the country there's different kind of customs yep. of 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 the way that the way that you hunt um mm -hmm. and so it's but it coming from an area of um I mean, I don't even know if radios are legal in California because I just I just don't use them. It's just yeah. not a, a not a not a thought to me. Um, but you know, kind of seeing that was kind of odd. I mean, one guy rolled up yesterday, and and it's not like he had a radio. He had like a Secret Service yeah, clear a clear wire mm -hmm. earpiece like wired into running his ear down into his collar. Like, yeah. You know, it was like like this just wasn't. You know, you're just not out here with a couple of you know. $50 Motorola talk about. So, I mean, these guys are out here. Um, yeah. Ham you know, radios. They got some, yeah, they got, they got some pretty, pretty fancy radio gear. And, so. and one of the parts that drives that in Utah is Utah has made a decision. We're going to limit opportunity to a severe degree so that we end up with older age classes across all the species. Mm -hmm. And so drawing a tag, even as a resident in Utah, is very, very difficult. And so I think the hunting culture here is, hey, I didn't get a tag, but my friend did or my brother or my sister or my whoever, I'm going to go help them. Yeah. And that's what, that's just how they do it here. Yeah. What though, I mean, it's, I mean, that's the same, that's why I'm here. That's it's what like, I'm it's doing such here. A cool, right. It's such a cool, it's such a cool tag, I mean, to, to be able to come out on an opportunity of a, of a historic species in a, in a very unique and special place. Yeah. Um, is is a is a cool opportunity to to take advantage, and that's and that's great. That I mean, it's it's a it you know while the the radio communication is a little bit weird, yeah. Uh, to us, it's cool to see such big groups mm -hmm. and everybody sharing in that camp experience, that yeah. hunt experience. I mean, they're all that's all we're all doing the same thing in that regard mm -hmm. of of coming out and 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 enjoying this experience. And you know, there's 20 tag holders in here, and hopefully everybody's successful. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, uh, we definitely, you know, seen six, seven tag holders. I think so, something con like confirmed that. Confirmed or this thus far, so definitely yeah. folks are successful. There's one guy, the other non-resident here is running around with a traditional bow. So, yeah, he's... Um, we're... I, I think we're all kind of patiently wait, maybe hoping that he shows up and yeah. we'll give the llamas a workout so, <laughs> because uh, the llamas are just on a camping trip thus far. So yeah, yeah. JR and I were competing for you know guest points and he summarily smashed me with his culinary skills. But I'm thinking, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Newberg, here, here's your coffee. And, <laughs> you, you, I can warm up this water to wash the blood off your hands. And, yeah, but, I was just trying to make up for lost ground, but I don't think I got there. <laughs> well, we're sitting in your trailer right now. That's right. So, yeah, That's right, right. My trailer. Yeah, this trailer. I mean, mm -hmm. this is major points. 
And the camera guys are like trying to talk you into it now, saying, yeah. hey, look, Randy, yeah. you need they to spend your money on this. Exactly. I'm going to send you the bill if they <laughs> talk me into it, right? Sure. But no, I, in the mouth. I point out the, the radio thing not as a criticism or a complaint. It just mm-hmm. takes some getting used yeah. to. Because yeah. in your mind, you you come to a place and you think, all right, it's going to be like where I hunt, where ra- like in Montana, radios are illegal. Um and then it's not. It just when you when Ray said, "Yeah, it's, it was busy out there that first mm-hmm. morning." It was, mm-hmm. and it kind of set me back for a minute. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, "Well, this is how it is. This, you know, everybody's here having a good time. Yeah, let's." But the great thing is that even if you hunt the way you hunt, or we normally are used to hunting, you can still make that happen in this environment. So yeah. after that first morning, where we were like, "Wow, this is everywhere." Still later that day, we got to an angle and found some bison that nobody else could see yep. and you and the camera guy made a stock and no you know it made was a great shot and, and if, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we saw where you shot the buffalo we were fully wholly mm-hmm. convinced that it was going down it acted like oh look he's we saw the arrow in it. we were hiking up the other side trying to find first blood and they came down no shot what no yeah don't tell me what I saw. Mm-hmm. I saw it. Uh, you got him. But, you know, it was the, that type of hunting. You can still mm-hmm. do it uh, right. no matter what. Maybe you have to walk where there's not any roads or get yeah. get where they're not. And, and that's fine. still have that. Uh, that's the experience I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. And uh, we we found it. And, but yeah, since Dan brought it up. About, <laughs> we got we to gotta put it out <laughs> we, there. We got to put it out there. Thanks, so, Dan. Come clean. Uh, the first morning... There were a bunch of people who were on ATVs and we were glassing from a different location and we all, every, the, way up high, everyone can see the same bison. Yeah, everybody's mm-hmm. looking Everybody's looking at the same bison and trying yeah. to figure out. Who's going to get so there that's, first. That's, a, that's another very unique aspect about this hunt. They're above it, timberline. They're above timberline. They're exposed and they're, and they're, they're huge. out. And they're huge and they're <laughs> easy to spot. It's not like you're, you know, it's it's... Spotting it's is just, not the it's problem. Very, it's very different from hunting, you know, any any of the other species, just because of the nature of of, yeah. of what it is, and that's that's an important like framework that I think people I put their mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when they see in. it on YouTube, I'm sure they're going to think, "Wow, that's not at all what I expected." Mm-hmm. But that group over at that radio tower, they had a group of bison below them, and they had a group of bison above them. We go and park away from those guys, and we decide to go after the bison up above. Well, they sent one of their guys who had a tag, they had two tags, racing up the road in front of us, parks, and he tried, because he saw we were loaded our packs, had our bow, and we were heading up the ridge. Walking. Yeah, walking. (laughs) Walking. He drove his ATV up around the corner and parked and wanted to get in front of us, which, fine, whatever. If he's listening, uh, the idea wasn't to push him. Mm -mm. There were just so many groups of bison. We'd seen three different groups of bison. So we thought, if he goes low, we'll go high. If he goes left, we'll go right. So we're just dogging along behind him. If we wanted to, we could have certainly passed him going up the ridge. But so it turned out to be a lot of people, you know, in one place because there were so many bison. So the learning experience that we benefited from is staying up there on the mountain and just watching everything unfold. We saw two groups of bison go through that long string of aspens Mm -hmm. that eventually would help us out. So, but that was the morning hunt of opening day. What Dan's referring to is uh, later that day, JR had spotted this group of bison in this little saddle that it almost seemed too good to be true mm-hmm. because they were mm-hmm. so accessible. And they were bedded down. Yeah. 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 But it, I think I, I think up in there, I, I, they were just in this perfect little hidey mm-hmm. spot that was just pretty difficult to get to, but we just happened to have the right angle into this, into this mm-hmm. little saddle between these two knobs. And there yeah. they were bedded and comfortable and not out in the open, which I think naturally your eyes are kind of drawn to these big open areas to try and find them and yeah. to, to try and find them in that little spot. It was, it was a great setup for us. Nobody yeah. else was on them. No, they, they didn't seem to have been disturbed. So the plan was that Marcus and I would go in on the stock and that Dan would film from afar with JR and Ray to give commentary. <laughs> Color. 
color commentary. commentary. So Marcus, also known as Lunger, he is extremely <laughs> sick this hunt. And if you watch the movie Tombstone, uh, Doc Holliday yeah. had tuberculosis and they called him Lunger. Well, Marcus is battling some sort of serious jag that's got him down, but he stuck with it. And so he and I go out there and we get to 200 yards of them and they got us pinned down. And then they finally move around just maybe 50 yards in a little cluster of pinions and they bed down. So now we can cover some ground. We get to about 140 and one little yearling decides to get out and stare us down. I don't know how long that lasted, 30 or 40 minutes. Finally, the yearling goes over to check out, see what's going on, ends up getting all the other ones back up out of their bed. They go back over to your side of the... I don't know if you guys could see them, but they came more your direction. Mm -hmm. Marcus and I try to cross this last little gap. And if we can get to these next group of trees and sneak through them, we're going to be 30, 40 yard shots. Well, at about 80 yards, this old cow happens to step out just when we're stepping between two trees and she just pegs us. So we stand there for the longest time and the bull is acting like it's the rut, but I think these things rut in July, if I remember right, July or August. And he's acting goofy as all can be. And finally the cow, she just says, uh, the gig is up. The wind went towards them and she was already on alert. So when that wind swirled down in that saddle, they all take off and the bull mills around for about, I don't know, 45 seconds. And when he takes off, he doesn't take off in a big hurry. Well, unknown to Marcus and I, <laughs> Dan and Ray and JR are over watching this unfold. And... We couldn't see you guys. From the time y'all dropped over the back of the ridge, it was about an hour. Uh, at, at, least, at least an, at hour. Least an hour, hour and, and a half, maybe. It was just killing us, and we kept trying, and we couldn't see any bison or or y'all. And then, and I'm like, oh, they may have gone out the back. We were saying what could have happened, and y'all may be pursuing them back there. But then we started seeing you know bison in there and we're like okay they're still there and they have to know that and they've got to be on them and this is going to happen mm -hmm. you know it was no doubt randy newberg's going to drop one of these guys and <laughs> yes and then when we, they bugged out from there we saw the group and we're following oh you know he must have shot and and then a little bit later comes that big bull and he looks like he's rumbling and stumbling and bumbling and jr's like if you look right behind his quarter you know i think i see an arrow and then right, right at the right at the fur break yeah. between the real thick stuff and the thin stuff that's what like we right wanted to see maker. and i'm like oh you're right yeah, i see it too you know like <laughs> <laughs> like he got him we're like well, we don't see blood but you know their hair is so thick it's absorbing that i mean we yeah, had yeah, it we, all, we, we we all played out but but the fact that he wasn't shot was not an option in that scenario <laughs> so everything we saw led to that and we're all excited like oh day one look at that second stock uh, and well and then and then you guys came out Right, and so we had—I mean, we had all this suspense build up for like an hour and a half, and like yeah. mm -hmm. you know, it's like you guys drop over, and it was like it was like forty-five minutes, and then we finally start seeing a, a buffalo, see a, a bison move in there. So we're like, all right, all right, they're there, and then it's like another like forty-five minutes, and you're trying to figure it out. And there was at one point you could—we just we had a tough angle, we really couldn't see that in there real well. And there was this one we saw that like he laid down, and you know, earlier in the day we saw when we were up high on that hill, we saw where a guy had shot one, and and that he kind of just he the bison. And just kind of laid down and they had to wait him out right yeah. and they didn't want to push him and, and even then i'm like I'm like well, maybe he shot that one and that guy's <laughs> bending him down and they're just That's probably what happened. and the yeah. other ones are the other ones are just too shocked and they don't know what to do so they're just standing there because they, well, they, they were so back stealthy. like hey carl like, where are you at carl and like, he's like i'm hurting you yeah. and then so you know and then so when they come they they come out and it was like we saw the the first five and we didn't know how many mm -hmm. were in there, but we thought that was all of them, uh -huh. right? And then all so they're in a group, and then this last one comes out. So then it's like, oh, 
Totally. Of course this one's shot. He's coming out so much later. He's There's running slower. He's running, he's running and slower. And, and, when, and when a bison a, runs downhill, yes. it's really they kind of yeah. have a, a stumbly kind of gait to them. Well, well, the bigger lumber. they are, the more it looks like that I recognize later. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. but, then, uh, but then you and Marcus come out and like you're on their initial path yeah. and mm-hmm. then they turned and they broke downhill but you guys kept on that that side that side hill and out Horizontal. to the trajectory yep. so you could go around the corner and look and like, oh, like they what are they on a doing false trail. well they're probably not seeing any blood because that forearm is like you know it's totally absorbed all the blood what are they doing <laughs> over there we should go we should go in down below where we last yep, we like, know where the blood trail is you know, let's landmark <laughs> this yeah let's landmark we this landmark we'll do it. you know there's that there's that stump let's, let's look at that dead stump we're gonna go down there and go walk around so Formulated our out. plan. Uh-huh. We was like, uh, okay, you're going to go talk to Randy and them. Tell them we see where f- last blood was. So we're going to drive down, hike back up, get on that blood, <laughs> and, you know, we'll... <laughs> <laughs> we'll start the tracking oh. for you. And we were there. We, we drove had the, down we there. Had the tenderloins cooked already, <laughs> we were, man. We were yeah. <laughs> and, and I sent a text. Or I tried calling Marcus, and then I sent a text. I said, hey, what happened? Did he get a good shot? And Marcus tried to reply and then forgot to send it. So I'm hiking all the way over there. I finally get a text on my phone that says, no shot. So then I got to find Ray and JR. Uh, and I'm like, I'm humming bad back news, up. And I look up and I see Dan. He's like, bad news. What? No shot. Yes, there was a shot. <laughs> Ray's like, he don't try arrow. to tell me what like, I saw. Yeah, I know what I saw. It, 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 it was real. But you guys were a thousand yards away, so. Yeah, and but we had binos. <laughs> yeah. But, yes. uh, so, were you guys, when you came back to the truck and I stand in there and I still had all five arrows in my quiver, were you guys doing an inventory to make sure that? Well, yes. When we were going back, <laughs> even Dan said, like, or oh, this is the biggest trick ever. You yeah, know, like, like Marcus <laughs> is just pranking us. Yeah. <laughs> Has to be. I mean, we saw oh, that thing. I've, I've got more laughs out of that part of this hunt than anything. It shows the power of suggestion. Was, you see think, what you want to see, and we darn sure is. wanted to see that. Yeah. Yeah. that and it video was glorious. Clip. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was just funny because I mean we just we had from the t- time that you guys departed us and just these different layers of suspense build and you disappeared over the hill and then nothing's happening and then you see the bison and then they're they're in there and then it's like they look like they're kind of moving away and then they and then they kind of turn back and you're like oh man it is on and you just <laughs> you just I mean your 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 mind just kind of racing when you don't really know what's going on you up, you like manifest it. it yeah oh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got the whole story concocted and this is going to be oh, it and so funny well we have the footage to prove that <laughs> there was no shot i i wish there would well, we have the footage to prove there was a shot oh yeah, okay. that's right <laughs> yeah right from a thousand yards away. yeah <laughs> and we have the recovered bison too I, I right? have the did you guys find memory. any blood when you went looking for <laughs> no, first blood no. we didn't even get Imagine all over that. the it was that fur it was the sorb in it we 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 had, <laughs> we had an explanation for that too uh, we, just, we justified everything uh-huh. in our heads huh well, I don't know. I must have brought a sixth arrow with me or yeah. something. My quiver, all, I know. I had five in my quiver and one I on the string. You there you go. Laser yeah. eyes or yeah. something. Oh, that's funny. Well, after that, uh, we came back, took care of the llamas for a little while to camp. Had to feed them and untangle them. Untangle them. They seemed to find any little bush to get tangled in. And... Uh, so we went back up to that glassing spot, and there were two bison that were up high, right? Were they up high to start with? They, yes. They were yeah, because yeah. that one got, guy, that one guy that was all the way at the top. Right, had shot, shot that one, one out of the group of three. Mm-hmm. That's when they started to come down. Yeah, and then the other two come down, and we had watched a guy shoot a bull just below those earlier in the day. So we kind of had a feel of what they were going to do. And when they did that, it was, for me anyhow, uh, I almost felt like, well, this is an exercise of futility, but I'm going to go do it just because there are two big bull bison there. And I got to do what I get, what I came here for, and that is to try arrow one of these things. So Marcus, being the longer, said, 
I'm staying back and filming because as bad as I'm hacking and coughing, we aren't going to get within 100 yards of these things. So Dan grabs the -the over-the-shoulder camera on this Mm -hmm. encounter. Marcus takes the bazooka lens, as we call it. And Ray and JR and Marcus stay way back. I don't know. How far do you suppose you guys were from Uh, We were over 1,000 yards, but I'd say. And so Dan and I are able to take this road that, yeah, it's, they should almost put asphalt on it because of how much traffic it gets. Mm-hmm. But it, it went down into this grove of trees that gave us this cover to climb up the mountain unseen. We get up there and get right to the edge of the trees. And now there's a great big bison across the basin from us that had come up the hill. Yeah. But we, he was, he wasn't an option for us. Mm-mm. Actually, Jim, the other non-resident, ended up going after that bison. Yep. He told yep. us the next morning. And uh, so we lucked out. Dan and I are standing on the cover of the last couple trees, and we see the bison, the, the group of two, we see one of them overlooking towards that other bison across the basin. And one of them turns around and just disappears. And I think, what happened? And I take two or three steps up the hill where I could just clear that rock ledge. He'd bedded right behind that rock ledge. And all you could see was his big hairdo and the tops of his horns. And his uh, buffer fro. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> what he's got. And so I, I told Dan, I said, we're just going to wait here for about 45 minutes. And then we're going to have the light at our back and right in their eyes, and we're going to sneak up there. And the wind will be coming down. Yeah, yeah have the downhill perfect. thermal. We're, we've got everything. We've got that little rock lip. When we peek over that, it's going to be 30 yards. Hopefully, we don't get stampeded. <laughs> we did so We did chuckle about something like yeah, that, Yeah, you said if, if they tried to stampede us that I should run and then come back and steal your... Your keys. My truck keys. Yeah, I told them where my truck keys were. I said, we're going to be so close. <laughs> I, I said I'd steal some of your gear, too. Yeah, yeah. I said, take my gear, too. I, I, I just felt that we were going to get so close. When we started that stock, I thought it was going to be a waste of time. And then when they bedded down, I thought, oh, man, this is it. And from afar... You guys are probably thinking. That was a great one to watch because we oh, could see everything. Yeah. And we knew that they were just on the other side of that knob and that y'all would have an approach. And we could just see you from the time you came out of the trees. Uh, you know, the whole thing. It was a really cool vantage point to watch it from. Yeah. We had Unlike to... the other one where we had to make up what was happening. <laughs> 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 we could actually just know what was happening. <laughs> and our minds would not run away with us. <laughs> and it was and it was perfect cuz I mean you could you could see the you could see the two bedded right where they we I mean, we could see them clear as day cuz we just had that perfect angle on them. We could watch you guys walking up. The you know there was some spotted, you know, broken cloud cover and the sun was heading down and then it would clear mm-hmm. the clouds and just, I mean, the sun's basically where you guys, it's almost like perpen, you know, or parallel with you. So you just, this this backlighting of luminescence is, is before it, you know, before it crested below the skyline. I mean, it was just so cool. I hope, it was I hope beautiful. that footage, the way that footage comes out and the, the way the hill got illuminated, it yeah. was, it was, it was a great, it was a great vantage point to sit there and watch that. And all talking about it afterwards, we were having the same conversation conversations y'all were having because the sun was behind the clouds it was going to break through one set of clouds there was another set of clouds and then one more breakthrough before sunset and i was like okay as soon as that sun goes through there it's gonna be right in them you got to do this and y'all were talking about the exact same thing of waiting Mm -hmm. for that sun as soon as that sun you can so you're part of you were doing on that yeah that's you guys probably wondered why we were waiting there just for a minute or two Because I I kept looking back and I saw, all right, when the sun gets through that last cloud, they're going to be blinded. And we were coming in directly into the sun as far as what they could see. So... It, that was the plan, and there were there were groups of people watching us. Oh, Every yeah. knob I looked Every, at yeah. had people watching. We talked to people about it. <laughs> yeah, like are they the ones that you? Yeah. Uh, well, we get up there. I drop my pack, drop my binos. The only thing I have, I, I did carry. I disconnected my rangefinder from my bino harness, and we're getting closer and closer and closer. And there's a sh- little sharper rock ledge to our left, but it's crumbled away in the shale and it was going to be so noisy 
I'm like, no, I'm going to veer a little bit to the right. And we get there, and now I can see, like, from his eyebrows up. And I'm <laughs> ranging, and it's, I don't know, 70 yards. And I told Dan, let's just crawl. So we get on our hands and knees. I'm just putting my bow in front of me, crawl, put my bow in front of me. Finally. We're they, telling you to crawl faster. Yeah. Oh, we're yeah, we're yeah. Come on. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, and the bad part was. We're like, that, come on, Randy, you're that, losing light. Let's go. <laughs> right. And we did that last 15 yards. Mm -hmm. We lost, the sun went behind the horizon of the mountain mm -hmm. and we lost that benefit of them being blinded. But still, we get there. And when we're finally just completely out of cover, I, I range him and he's 55 yards and I turn to Dan. 55 and they stand up now once they stood up then i could see the one to the left until then i i knew he was there because there had been two of them but i couldn't see him and they the kind of milled there for 30 seconds or so and i'm trying to get a shot and it's just further than that one i think it was 51 or 53 mm -hmm. yards and so the they move over to the left and now we can use that little rock knob mm -hmm. and I'm not worried about the noise of all the scree underneath and it's like, well, they know we're here. So we circle over there to the left and they're coming underneath us now and I range it 43 yards and the front one stops, but he looks straight up at us. And when he did, he kind of cocked his body a little bit, closing that pocket that you'd hold for. And I'm at full draw, and I don't even know what Dan and I are saying to each other, but I'm, I'm on the front one. I'm like, all right, he's not going to give me a shot. So I go to the one behind him, and just as I do that, he leans forward maybe a half step, and now his front leg, to me anyhow, because it's not a full broadside shot, I don't know what it'll look like on camera, it was somewhat quartering, but when he, it appeared as though that front leg was further back than I wanted. I was like, well, that's not a shot. So I go back to the front one and I'm at full draw this whole time. And just as I get to the front one, he takes a step and he starts walking. I'm thinking, well, I'll go to the back one. Well, as quick as I get on the back one and get my pin, he starts walking, following the other one. And you guys got to be thinking, what the hell is going on, <laughs> Randy? Why are you not shooting? Yeah, we were but, guessing the yardage. You're like, you're right there. You got him. <laughs> you got him. Uh, you could, you could, you could see him though when you when you mm -hmm. drew. They they turned at you, and you're just, you could, you could tell the angles just didn't didn't look good. Yeah, yeah. So, I thought we had it though. I was, those first two stocks, I was a hundred percent sure that was going to be our last hunt. Like this, oh, it's yeah. going to happen these times, and then. Total opposite on the last. Well, that was the most perfect, <laughs> epic stock ever. Like where I, I had so much confidence that that one was going to work out mm -hmm. more than any of the other ones. And yeah. then he tried the uh, to get him to stop. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> deer right trick. do not stop. You <laughs> no, can whistle. No, it doesn't you can, work. You can do the white tail grunt. You can do, hey, try well. everything. So they ended up running down. They got away from us, and but it was exciting. It was. It was, was really, awesome. really the perspective, exciting. Just watching those hunts from that perspective. Ooh, we're getting a lot of snow now. Look at them big flakes. But yeah, uh, yeah that was such a cool perspective to be able to watch the animal and y'all. And it got exciting when they were all in the same frame. Uh, Marcus was saying, oh, yes, they're both in the same frame. And, you know, <laughs> but it was just so fun to watch it from that point of view. Well, I, I really thought, as much as I thought that stock was futile when we started, once they bedded, my confidence swept. 180 degrees. Yeah. I'm, I was thinking, well, maybe I should just get my tag out and punch it right now. Uh, uh, this <laughs> guy's they, dead. When they bet, and then when we saw him, when they when they betted up, they're like, oh, this is this is it. This is all. The only thing that we couldn't quite tell was from your timing from coming up through the trees and getting onto that kind of the spine of the ridge line, where you in theory could see him. What what were you gonna? Could you could you still see them? Yeah, you know, or would you be too far over to the right and maybe think, well, if they drop to the left, we lost them, or or vice versa. Yeah. And so it's hard to tell. But then because we didn't see you for a while, and then we only finally picked you guys up when you were probably maybe a third of the way mm -hmm. yeah. up, mm. up to the rocks, yeah. about a third of the way. That's when we finally picked you up. You were, we're behind like, that right. ridge, I think, at first. Yeah. And then like, you got on the spine. We, yeah, we, we had to because that little bench they bedded on was only probably 40 yards, 50 yards across. Mm -hmm. Well, 
where we were at, if we would have came right up the ridge line, that it had too much gain to it right away, and they would have been able to see us. So mm-hmm. we veered to the right because mm-hmm. we also had the wind over there, and we came up that steeper face to the right. And then once we got closer, that's when we came to the ridge because now we were so close to them, they couldn't see over the crown yeah. of the rock. And we were thinking, okay, we don't see them. Like, they need to get going, get up there. <laughs> and we said maybe, you know, maybe they're on that backside for that reason. And when you popped up, that's when we got excited. Like, yeah. There they go. It's done, Dale. Good thing you didn't leave your tag. We'd have punched it right there. So, yeah. Better get him, Randy, because this tag is punched. <laughs> Oh, well, it made for good camp st- campfire stories that yes, night as JR cooked us some uh, mm. salmon that you'd caught this uh, this summer. California Pacific King salmon. Yeah. Oh, man, that was good. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, th- I think that's what gave us the energy for day two. Must be. Well, so those mega threes, it's definitely. Yeah, something like yeah, that. You know, that's, that's, how, that's how I justify it. Yeah. So the next morning, second morning, we get up. And we drive up to this one glassing spot. I was surprised there was nobody at that glassing spot. Because Everybody of, was a little less enthusiastic, I must say, that morning. Moving yeah. a little bit slower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But determined. Yeah. And so we got there, and you could see other rigs at the normal glassing locations. And then we saw that one group of bison way up by the pass. So we drove up there. And they're just on private by a skosh. Mm-hmm. And there was one young bull and like 14 or 15 cows, cows and calves. And calves two, yeah. two of the cows had radio collars on mm-hmm. them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they let the guys get some really good footage of them, though, if mm-hmm. nothing else. It was like they had on X and they knew they were just on, <laughs> on the inside of private. They're like, uh, hey, y'all got this app, right? So you know you can't get us. <laughs> it's, what the radio, it's what the radio callers were. It's like the invisible fence for a dog. Yeah. They don't go yeah. We didn't know that on X was out there putting their app on radio <laughs> yeah. callers. Mm-hmm. Now we know. Mm-hmm. We, they blew their cover. Here. That's right. <laughs> uh, so we left them, went back down to our glassing spot, and that's when we saw three big bulls way, way up high above mm-hmm. the clouds. I mean, mm-hmm. at times they'd disappear, and, and the then the clouds would yeah. come, uh, would disappear, would blow out, and you could see them, and it kept doing that. And Marcus was really jonesing that we should go after those. And I'm thinking, oh, man, that's another one of those wide open, how are we going to kill them yeah. sort of stocks. But he almost, his level of let's go almost had me there. And then we saw the other big herd to the north, but we we figured they there was a fifty fifty chance that they were on private. Again, they were yeah they were mm-hmm. definitely they were definitely flirting with private over there. So yeah. that was a that was a that was a tough go and yeah and so we had to you know yeah. they were a long ways long ways away. But I mean you're gonna you're gonna move and go for them if you can. But no one kind of yeah. what we saw this morning. Yeah, but as we're uh, scouring the herd to the north, trying to figure out if they're on public or private. Ray comes over and says, well, you have any interest in shooting one of these four that look like they're going to come right down here to us? I thought he was kind of jerking my chain. I look and got the new spotter out. Yeah, all four of them are bulls. And lucky. Right right above the and same it, spot. Of yeah, the going down the same exact stock. I yeah. said... This is going to play out exactly as you know this play. You know this stock. They're going to have come right down the hill because somebody walked the top ridge. Yeah. They killed the bull before, and and they bumped them off the back, and then I caught them as they were just coming down right towards that knob on the little trail, and I'm like, wow, that's exactly what they're going to do. Yeah. They took the same exact trail right. yep, as those did. two I stocked mm-hmm. at yeah. dark the they're night gonna before. Come down, they're going to come down to that little ledge right above the rock, and they're no just going to hang out there. They may be, they may mm-hmm. just stand mm-hmm. there as buffalo just do and stand there and stare at each other and off yeah. of the space. Yeah. And so a little side note that I forgot to add from the night before, uh, that shot at 43 yards, even if I could have made it, I the pocket they gave me or the way they'd closed it by pivoting, only chance I had was a long shot. I, there's no way I could have tried to go inside and tight for a heart. And people have told me who've archery hunted bison, uh, uh, biologists have told me, a long shot on a bison, they will stay on their feet from five to eight minutes. Well, at last light, 
The last mm-hmm. thing I want is a long shot bison heading down into one of these canyons, not bleeding much, but on the full trot, mm-hmm. and us not have the light to follow or track him or whatever. So that was another thing that was going through my head that night. And that's a hard decision when you uh, could imagine being in your shoes. When you've put in for this tire for 20 years, you get this tag, but it still comes down to having to make that, if you will, ethical decision of, I mean, you could have hit him with an arrow. Right. There's no oh, doubt about for that. Sure. But yeah. you had to weigh, is this the right shot to take? And you decided that it wasn't. And yeah. that's, you know. Yeah, and, you know, and you can look back if you didn't get something and say, "Man, I should have took the shot" or whatever. But, right. but you know, I think you made the right call based off what you thought the right thing to do was there. Yeah, and the reason I bring that up is because I said if I had that same shot tomorrow morning, I'd take it because we'd have daylight right. and could watch mm-hmm. them and know where they went, have all day, blah blah blah. A lot of variables. Yeah. Well, little did I know that these four bison that Ray spotted, we drive to the same exact spots the night before, and th- we think that they're going to be coming down to this bench and mill around again. Mm-hmm. Well, as Dan and I are down there parked in the trees getting loaded, here comes JR and Ray and Marcus saying, hey, they didn't bed, they're just trucking. You know, it, we, we're going to have to go and relocate them. And... I said, I think all of us said, well, no, that patch of we, aspens. We knew, we, no, yep. we knew at that point when they dropped off. We know like, where they're going. They're doing what those two groups yep. the, the day before did. They're going to yeah. come right down through those patch of aspens. Yeah, so you guys took off up ahead where you could glass. Yeah, we went further south. Last time we were on the north, and we went to the right. south, and y'all hustled down there. Yeah, so Dan and I, there's a place we said where the wardens checked us on because mm-hmm. we got checked opening day. Two good guys stopped and visit with us park the truck there and we got to get up the hill through this big string of aspens well it wasn't that even though it's an incline and it's a ways up there the bison have such a path mm-hmm. furrowed in there it, you know well, <laughs> this is their path it's <laughs> it makes a cattle path look insignificant yeah compared to this trail well once we got in there i just told dan we're just going to follow this trail up to the top where either they're, maybe they're not in here and we'll see them up higher even or if they get in here they go across because remember some of those groups would get into those aspens but then at the very top they'd curve and go further yep, south over there. Yep. so I wanted to get to where either uh, they'd come down the trail we're on or the trail that curves south and so we're walking and Dan's getting all these cool shots and I I'll, I hear Dan whistle at me. Uh, my hearing sucks so bad. <laughs> when I'm walking through dead aspen leaves and the wind's blowing, you just about got to throw a rock at me. So he whistles. I turn. I'm like, what? He's like, he's right up there. I'm like, huh? He's like, I think that's a bison. And he puts his binoculars up. Yeah. Well, let me preface that with when you, usually when you're glassing and you think, because I, I kind of thought it was like a tree stump. And whenever you think you're glassing a tree, you're like, oh, that's a bear. And it's always a stump. But yeah. well, this was the opposite. So I was like, I think that's a tree, a but I should check just in case. <laughs> yeah. Because I, yeah. I really didn't think it was a bison. Yeah. And from and from our vantage yeah. point, we're glassing back in there because we came around the corner and the bison definitely weren't above. They, they had disappeared somewhere. So most likely they're in those aspens, you know, or they had already come through and we missed them. We didn't know, know if they went on what. down the drainage. Because if, if they had ran, they could have... And I'm glassing in there, and it, well, there's there's green and yellow leaves in there. Not many leaves have fallen yet, and so it's real thick. And then I can just see this brown spot, and I just hold on it, and it feels like an eternity. And then all of a sudden, I see it. You know, I just see it move and disappear. I'm like, they're in the trees. <laughs> and then by that time, you guys were, you know, kind of really around the corner, right on the edge, right on the edge of the aspens, and we're like. You know, ga- game on. They're you know, gonna Randy run into and, them. Randy and Dan at the bottom, and four bison mm-hmm. at the top. What's how's this play out, right? Yeah. Well, I I don't know if they heard us, smelled us, saw us, but yeah, because an ATV came by down below us on that road, and a truck at the too. same time, mm-hmm. right when yep. right yep. when Dan said it's bison for sure. And then I could hear, yep. I, I still hadn't seen them, but I could hear them. And Dan said, they're going this way over towards those pinions on the edge. 
And then I could, it's like, yeah. So we go to the first little opening and I'm ranging and they're coming across 50, 48, 50, 48, but they're not stopping really. Well, one did. The back one Mm -hmm. turns and he's kind of looking downhill. Again, another quartering towards shot. And the other three, they're not wasting any time. Fortunately for me, the big one in the back was letting the three young guys go and clear out all the danger, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so then we drop and we're now having to borderline run. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're having to cover some ground to parallel them on the hill. And we get over there and the three in the front are kind of bunched up and looking downhill to where that road is. And Dan says, what about the one in the back? And I range him and it's 43.8 yards and I'm come to full draw. And one thing that still stuck, stuck in my mind the night before and that day is when you're on a really steep slope like that, what you think is your vertical uh, hold on your bow rather than canting mm-hmm. it, I still oh, yeah. tricky. I, I yeah. have a bubble and I had to force myself to get away from being canted. I felt like no, this, uh, my sight has to be broke. Because it's natural to lean mm-hmm. away from the mountain and it's, and, and you so, had to force yourself to go towards it, it. It's taken a while, but he's slightly quartering away and I only have 20, 30, and 40 yard pins. Obviously at home, I shoot way longer than that. So at 43.8 or 44, whatever it was, I held mid-body. I'm thinking, ah, uh, it'll drop a little bit. And... Sometimes you have that, this animal is dead, whether it's a rifle shot or an archery shot. And I just had that feeling that I didn't have the night before. I don't even remember releasing. I, it's just, I think you get he, to... He was in, I mean, just, I just from our vantage point, like clear as day, he was in a way better position. He was he was completely broadside to you, a way a way better way better setup, fully paused. Yeah. I could just, the, the from the distance, it just look it the situation just looked significantly better. Yeah. And when I released the arrow, all I remember seeing is that white and red fletching disappear right behind the front shoulder and then kind of pop out. I, it, it, it disappeared and then it came back out. I'm like, what the hell happened there? And Dan said, great shot. I'm thinking to myself, felt great, but <laughs> let's, not get, let's not get too excited yet. And then they crossed right down below us at 60 yards, and there's just blood streaming down inside. And uh, I just said, that, that bull's going to die. If if not, by that time, he'd broke the fletching off mm-hmm. or it disappeared it, it, or something. It broke right away, and certainly my you know my my recollection you know can't really be trusted after the day before <laughs> <laughs> but i swear you know when 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 i saw it it was when you had taken a couple steps and it had that like that like the, the it looked like the arrow Flopping. was into the into the shoulder blade cuz it was like swinging and whipping around ah, okay right but then i saw plenty of blood I'm so like, we were wondering if he was wondering if it hit the outside shoulder, but yeah. when you saw it disappear, it went all the way through, hit that opposite shoulder, bounced back out. Yeah. yeah. And so then when he was running, it was flopping, but it wasn't yeah. because it didn't go in. It, yeah. it was, and, and I and I'm pretty maybe that it, that's exactly is what I saw, but it had it had snapped off, you know, two inches above above the, the arrowhead above the arrowhead, and then I think yeah, then it it did it did pop back out. But, oh, the, okay. but the br- blade had certainly gone through and done its damage on yeah. on the way in. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, exactly. It. So from helped. your angle, it looked like I hit a shoulder blade, and he or, just or shook the. Because it just had that, like that, you know, that like that whipping yeah. didn't sink. It's thing. just barely in. But I, but then I, you're, I mean, I saw plenty of blood. Yeah. You know? and, and again, I preface that with I saw blood the day before. <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> and he <laughs> saw it in our head. And like, saw what are we all flapping so, that day too? So, yeah. and uh. of those three stocks, this one was the one that I was like, yeah, you know, it's probably not going to happen because. They'd bumped down, they'd got in there. Y'all were hustling, you know, yeah. to get in there. And I'm thinking, how are you going to get your breath down to even hold that pin on there? And there, and when they popped out, I thought, that, well, that's it. Because usually when they are on the move, 
you're not going to be able to intercept them like y'all did. Yeah. And y'all were moving over there really quickly, set up. It all just happened so fast that the other ones, I was ready to punch your tag. And that one, I was thinking, okay, how are we going to do it next time? <laughs> yeah. Well, I would bet that he wasn't going to stand there another second or two because right. the other three had already mm-hmm. started. And mm-hmm. I'm fortunately, I just had that feeling at that time. But after I hit him, they went down in those Aspens mm-hmm. for a long time. And Dan and I are standing there. Where are they? We can't see them. Mm-hmm. They're out of sight of us. We can see you guys way across there. And you, you must be looking at us. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. then I see three bison come out of the Aspens. I can just see them starting to come out. And I'm looking. I don't see one that has a lot of blood. So I'm starting to do the <laughs> shucking and jiving dance there. I'm thinking he's dead. Well, now here he comes walking out of the Aspens. I'm like, oh, great, Randy, you're up here dancing. And he's going to walk off never to be seen again. Mm-hmm. And... uh well, at that point, when Marcus, uh, you know, because we couldn't really, we could see part of what was going on, uh, but he, Marcus said, "Oh, Randy just put his hands up and did the woohoo," you know. And we're like, "Oh, what? <laughs> awesome! Maybe it's a good shot," you know. And so that's when Jr. We're like, "Well, he may go down this drainage past yeah. the road." So that's JR what I thought he did. Went down there to either be able to track him or maybe bump him to go back uphill because we didn't want him running down and that stuff. I mean, we got llamas, but you still got to yeah. get down there. And so we weren't sure where the bull you shot was. Yeah. I, until they stepped out of those aspens, I thought they might have got across and crossed the road because we could not see the road that where those aspens continue Weird. across. Yeah. I thought, dang it, there, he's going down in that canyon. Mm-hmm. Well, then That's what I thought he they come out. His three buddies are still in the lead, and he's walking kind of they're walking straight away from us now up that next ridge and he's got this little bit of wobble to him his back legs don't look very steady mm-hmm. and then he turns just like and, the one we saw the day before yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then he turns a little bit left which was the entrance side and i look and there is so much blood there i'm thinking how can this guy still be going it's five five six minutes mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. And and the other three are just like looking down at them like something's like what are you doing yeah that, that's yeah. something i noticed different about bison you know uh if, if they don't necessarily know one's been shot or been super busted when one gets shot the other ones kind of hang around like hey carl yeah. You coming? You know, like, <laughs> what you doing? You're not looking good, Carl. You know, and then they'll eventually get going, but they they don't just flee. Right. You know, and break up. Yeah. They kind of check on each other. That's how it was with these ones. And then you guys might have heard me give out the big hoop and yell. That's when we knew. <laughs> we yeah. heard. He, he, he collapsed. His, his rear end collapsed. And his front legs are still up. So he's sitting there like a, a dog. Mm-hmm. And... And I'm like, all right, if he's feeling this weak, he's not going to make it. And then I look, and in this seven or eight minutes he's been walking, he's now only 10 yards from the road. <laughs> above the road, <laughs> the too. Most, yeah, above on the, the high road. side. <laughs> I'm thinking, no one is going to believe this. They're going to think I just drove down the road yeah. and shot him out the window yeah. or something. But So then we just waited on him, and he he got he laid all the way down. But he still laid there moving his head a lot. And then he tried to get up as the other three started moving off. Mm -hmm. Not at a trot or anything, just walking. He tried to get up again and he barely got up and he just fell. And then he's laying on his side. He's trying to lift his head. And then he gave one last kick to get up and he rolled over on his back with all four legs up in the air. Mm -hmm. It was like, okay, I'm done. And from where we were, I I, I had to... Sorry, sorry, podcasters. You're not going to see this, but I took a. We were we were coming down the road in our in my truck, and we didn't know we didn't know we never yeah, saw him. Right. We mm-hmm. where oh, we were. So we, you guys couldn't we, see him fall. We where never he saw fell, him. At we, any, we never saw him. him at any point. And my truck was facing up the hill, and so I just like, well, I'll just back down the hill. It's not that mm-hmm. far, and so I'm backing down the hill, and you know I'm looking in my rear view and backing and backing, and then all of a sudden, and then I, you know I. 
I don't know what I did. I don't know why I paused or stopped and whatever. And I literally look out my, my window and he's just, he's literally right there, right up the hill from me. And so I kind of lean back so I can get a perspective. You can tell that I'm taking the shot out the window of my truck and there he is laying. <laughs> so doing the cadet and cockroach. Just <laughs> feet up. I go ahead and start up. skinning. <laughs> well, good. And, and fortunately he was held up by a piece of, piece of sagebrush because mm -hmm. uh, as, he would have rolled on as the road. nice of the road it would have been there's so much traffic up here and yeah. there was a camp that they were successful and they came out and they had a big they had a big travel trailer and one guy with a, a big old camper and yeah. so that would have gotten into a funky situation <laughs> like sorry guys either if you got sharp knives the road's blocked until this thing's yeah. out of here so why don't you jump on in and glove up oh, let's go but, yeah. so for I, our Buffalo roadblock would have happened. Yeah, but yeah I don't ten, know. I don't think 10 yards. I mean, maybe 10 feet. It was right there yeah. on How far the do you think that was in that, say, eight minutes that he traveled with, you know, 500 yards, 600 yards? I, I don't know. I 500 think maybe. Cause, but, yeah. but it was down maybe. and up, too. Yeah. So if yeah. you, if you okay. do that in it, it's probably 500 yards. And But he, it was like he was just doing us a favor. Yeah. Just going right <laughs> to the road and <laughs> rolling over. <sighs> That's when we saw him. We didn't know. We just really by I've, your shouts, we kind of figured it's good, it's done deal. So we're like, let's go meet him and start. We thought they're still he's still in the Aspens. Yeah, oh, okay. we'd, we'd seen the three. Mm -hmm. We'd seen the three, and so there clearly wasn't one missing. So at that point, it was huh. And we were like, you've got to be kidding me. Look at that right there. <laughs> <laughs> good thing we got llamas. <laughs> uh, well. I I don't know what you guys were able to film from that side of it. I mean, yeah, I just I looking at the footage right now. I've been sitting over here downloading the footage while you guys are podcasting. But yeah, it's cool. Two yeah. different angles. Uh, I mean, he filmed the we filmed the shot and everything. But yeah, as soon as they came down in the Aspens, we we lost sight of. The, okay, we saw the three eventually come up way after everything had happened, but we didn't realize that there was just a little depression in the sagebrush between you and us that he got in there and that's where he died. Yeah, that's crazy. I, I, oh, I've i never got an elk out hole. We could have got that bison out hole. I was trying to let you convince me to back my truck right up there <laughs> and put it in the back. More for selfish reasons I having a picture of that in the back of my truck. I, I, and then we could have just drove it right back to camp we, and processed it here. Because we could have if you would have backed up sideways, mm -hmm. perpendicular in the road mm -hmm. and dropped your tailgate against that steep mm -hmm. bank, we would only had to roll him 20 well, feet down a, a really we steep hill. We were just going to draw it right in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, that would have been, uh, as Marcus said, you know, you get extra points when you shoot yeah. one that close to the road. And we stopped here in Torrey, Utah to get a trailer full of llamas from our buddy Bo. We were thinking, all right, we're going to be packing one off a big tall mountain or out of a deep canyon. Well, the hard part here too is that there's just so many roads. And yeah, the bison are, all the bison are just in and amongst them. Yeah. So none. what do you do? You right. know, uh, you, you got to hunt them where they're at. Yeah. And yeah. So it's not, yeah. I mean, it, and yeah, that when it's something like a bison or a moose, it, it's definitely extra points if it's close to the road. <laughs> Brought it from I mean, we, it's not like we're trying to road hunt, but it's just, you know. Yeah. There's every place you go, there is a road. And mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, it's true. just the circumstances of what this hunt is. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, any, anyone who thinks you're going to come here and you're going to have this wild backcountry experience, at least for where the majority of the bison hang out, that's not the case. Your, your best option is shooting them at the top of the mountain. Right in the road. Which, <laughs> you know, that's what, what, what a guy did. And mm -hmm. it, I'm sure he had a hellacious back out. It sounds like they had 10 trips, 10 yeah. Yeah. between all the different guys and whatever, 10, 10 individual loads. Yeah, I'm roads really, everywhere does not mean that you're not going to put in some hard climbs and, right. you know, you still got to get up to them and where they're at. Yeah, but, where that guy shot that one was about as... Hard as it could probably get. Well, uh, if you went down in one of those canyons, it yeah, might be yeah, yeah, more yeah, risky. Talk about up, that but, guy. Cause. But the only thing is, I think if you shot him down in a canyon, there's always a road down below you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah here, there's that's, a, true. <laughs> that's what it seems like. So you're either so. going downhill or, you know, straight across somewhere. Yeah. So with that, folks, we have fulfilled the 20 year pursuit dream. Uh, a great, big old, very mature. Uh, Henry Mountain free range bison is hanging on a meat pole, a meat strap, mm -hmm. 
Uh, Ray got his ratchet strap and strung it between two big ponderosa pines here at the BLM campground, and we got a tarp over it, keeping the rain, which is now, since we've been podcasting, has turned to snow. Oh, man. That's a lot of snow out there. Wow. (laughs) So we have one hanging here, and today, this afternoon, we're going to go. We've let him cool all night. It got down into the... 20s or 30s last night. Yeah, mm-hmm. never, yeah. never turned to snow, so it had, it had to had be. Been in it the was 30s. low. It was low, low 30s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> clearly it's we're below freezing at this point. Yeah, now we're just snowed slash rained in. We yeah, <laughs> for the roads. Yeah, well, that's the other part is we can't get out right now, according to all the locals. I said, as hard as it rained yesterday and last night, you you aren't getting out for another day or two. I think you could get out with a truck, but you're not getting out with a trailer. No, no, uh-uh. and. Ray's pulling a fifth wheel, 27 foot trailer. I'm pulling a truck, a half ton, fully loaded with gear and another 2,000 pounds of llamas, and plus their hay and everything else. It, I'm not going up these switchbacks and all this snotty grease from all that <laughs> rain last night. I'm not in that big a hurry. Yeah, it was so. sketchy when it was dry. I can only imagine now. <laughs> yeah. I jacked up the bed of my truck because the curves were so bad. But. Yeah, Ray's got a ding where his fifth wheel, he had to turn such a tight corner on a switchback that the tongue of the fifth wheel decided to put a big gouge in the bed of his the box, the top passenger side of your... Mm-hmm. Oh, dang. Worth it. Worth it. <laughs> All this was worth it. This was truly what you could call epic to yeah. me. Yeah. It was amazing. Well, yeah. it's been just a fantastic experience sharing it with you guys. And I know a lot of listeners who've seen my past bison hunt have asked where my passion for bison comes from. And I think it started when there's a guy named James Willard Schultz. He wrote books, uh, two books, uh, Blackfeet and Buffalo, and the one before that was My Life as an Indian. And he was a guy who lived with the Blackfoot tribe in the 1850s and 60s when the liquidation of the Montana bison herds, well, the whole U.S. bison herds was underway. And he wrote, and he, if you get a chance to buy this book, I think it's from the Oklahoma University Press. Uh, Schultz lived in Montana uh, in the Missouri Breaks country up along the Rocky Mountain Front country and was a remarkable hunter, happened to be uh, a white guy who was living with the Blackfeet. And so he was able to tell these stories in such an amazing way it really piqued my interest in bison. And he, Schultz became the personal guide of George Bird Grinnell. When Grinnell came out to what what, what is now Glacier National Park, well, they're pulling stakes. Huh. Maybe he ran out of arrows. <laughs> we're not going to go there. Can of worms. That's a yeah. different story. <laughs> But uh, anyhow, uh, Schultz became Grinnell's personal guide. Uh, and one of Grinnell's big hunts was to try to take a mountain goat. And Schultz, they did it. Uh, and, and Grinnell was very old at the time relative to how whatever old was in the late 1800s. But Schultz was George Bird Grinnell's guide uh, for that mountain goat. And they were good friends. And Grinnell, what was it? Forest and Stream? Is that the mm-hmm. precursor to yep. Field and Stream? Yeah, he was the editor for Yeah, he was the editor of Forest and Stream at the time. So he did a great job of promoting Schultz and Schultz's stories about the bison and the life and culture of the Blackfeet and the tribes uh, of the plains. And so I, I got into reading all that. And that's really where my passion for bison came from. And J.A.R. and I have both, and Marcus, you may have read it also, The Last Stand. Yep. Uh... That book is just a remarkable documentary of the history of bison and how bison became the species that paid the price for building a conservation ethic in America. Because Grinnell and all of his experiences of coming out west, he saw the depletion, the liquidation of the wildlife herds and what struck him most is the bison. And... Uh, what there used to be 20 million or whatever and now there's 
you know, if you take genetically pure, free ranging wild herds, there's not that many. No, mm. it, it. I mean, I think the the book, The Last Stand, by by um, Michael Punky, and you, you, he's also the author that wrote The Revenant. Um, but yeah. it's it's a book that I think is essential, not just for any hunter, but I think anybody who has a concern uh, for wildlife. Yeah, because this is this is this this was the moment there there certainly were other components right the uh, uh, you know the the you know people seeking the the egret feathers right right there were there were other components that came along the way but from the bison from that from the late 1800s i think it was by 1973 we had eliminated or 1873 18. we had eliminated bison from kansas and divided the two herds into the north and to the south mm -hmm. basically and then you know if you read the book it talks about um really the the biggest challenges is were the is they were moving the railroads right. through through the west and that uh, the and through the railroads they were able to harvest essentially millions of, of, of bison and right. they were sought after in New York and their, their hides were sought after, their tongues were sought after. Um, and Grinnell, you know, kind of really recognized this and for, you know, a little, he had, and in, in the early 1870s, I think it was, there was some OC Mars expeditions out of Yale. Grinnell was educated at Yale, um, went on these marsh expeditions through the West in 73, 74, um, I think maybe 75, or I don't know which ones, I can't remember mm -hmm. exactly which ones he was on. But if you're ever in New Haven, Connecticut, go to the Peabody Museum of Natural History because many of those artifacts they discovered on those OC marsh expeditions are, are there now. And so I got to go there, um, last November and to see this after reading this book and, and I didn't even make this connection. And then I get there and I'm like, I'm like, wait a minute, these are from the Marsh expeditions that Grinnell was on that, you know, and I'd read and, and got really just infatuated with this book. And it's such a cool history of, you know, this was the movement that started it. And this is yeah. what started hunters being the the conservationists that they are yep. and i think and so it's incredible it, it's really critical i think for every hunter to read this but anybody else is to understand how this north american model was built this is the first cornerstone of it mm -hmm. this, yeah. this was it yeah our our conservation ethic that americans take for granted right now that book the last stand explains the history of where the seeds were planted and how the ground was fertilized to start having this thing called conservation in the United States. And you look at that, so here's some really cool tidbits to it is Grinnell went on a couple uh, survey expeditions. Uh, I think he was a surveyor, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. uh, with General Custer up into the Black Hills. And the treaties had been signed. Oh, we'll leave you the Black Hills. Well, yeah, that lasted as long <laughs> as they didn't find gold there. Well, when they found gold there, that, yeah. oh, this treaty isn't New working. plan. Yeah. Well, Custer asked Grinnell to come with him through the Powder River country on his next expedition. And Grinnell couldn't make it in 1876. Well, anyone familiar mm, with yeah. what happened to Custer when Good he came through? Good thing he through, didn't make that trip. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we wouldn't have had... Yeah. A Grinnell to become huh. the 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 big important figure he was, and he used his it platform. Was, it was shortly before. Um, I think it was it was shortly before he got invited to go on that expedition. He uh, was. Sure. That's when he became, became the the editor the, of the editor. Okay, of, yep. yeah, and so he couldn't leave his post mm. as editor of forest and stream and it sounded like he really wanted that and so he declined well <laughs> anyone familiar with the battle of little bighorn knows that uh yeah custer didn't fare real well there um yeah so here's from the book in the spring of 1876 probably just prior to receiving his invitation to accompany custer for forest and stream made grinnell a tempting offer the journal he needed the journal needed a new editor for its natural history page. Grinnell, who combined a passion for hunting and the outdoors with Yale pedigree, was an obvious choice. He accepted a job, and so what began a 35-year tenure with the magazine. 
There you go. So he was there until 1910 or 11. And he used that magazine to advocate for Yellowstone National Park, even though Yellowstone National Park had been formed. There was, there was no enforcement. It was, poaching was rampant. And in this book, it goes into all the rampant poaching that was going on in Yellowstone, how the last remnant herd of bison, which I think is why he, the title of this book is The Last Stand. Mm-hmm. That's some, some of degree. the most interesting storytelling part of that book. Oh, it's just the that, way he tells that story is Yeah, the poacher guy yeah. who was back there. And, they, and the guy who caught him. Yeah. It's just like, I can't remember the names either it, of them. But. Yeah, I can't either, but it's... It's remarkable, and Congress didn't have the gumption. Well, there's two things that were going to happen. They're going to put a railroad through Yellowstone Mm -hmm. Park, which Grinnell knew if they put a railroad through Yellowstone Park, the wildlife would be depleted just like everywhere else. So he used the magazine and his powers back on the East Coast to kill the railroad from going through Yellowstone. And then... Mm -hmm. He used that same platform to convince Congress to finally appropriate enough budget to have some enforcement enforcement in Yellowstone to keep the poaching at bay. They had to bring in the 7th Cavalry. Exactly. They brought in the 7th Cavalry. So here's another excerpt from from the book. The battle to save Yellowstone and its buffalo marked the first national showdown over over the environment. In the defeat of the railroad's ambitions for the park... And in the passage through the passage through legislation to protect the buffalo, the nation, for the first time in its history, made the conscious decision to prevent, protect wildlife and wild places when it cost something. Indeed, when powerful commercial interests stood in direct opposition, the year 1872 marked the birth of Yellowstone as a place. But in 1894, marked the marked the birth of Yellowstone as a commitment. Right, because it, it took Grinnell that long, of just continually so in in this interim grinnell roosevelt a bunch of these other people of the time formed the boone and crockett club and it was the boone and crockett club who finally i mean they were well connected people but they had a passion for hunting and for wild places and wild things and they used those connections to get all this passed. And what was it, 1892, 94, you just 1894. said? 1894. That was because that was the Lacey, no, the Lacey Act was 1900, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was 1894 when Grinnell felt that finally Congress had moved and done something to protect mm-hmm. the wildlife of Yellowstone. And how many million, Marcus, we live right next to Yellowstone, how many million visitors does it get a year? I don't, uh, three I don't million, remember the number. Some ridiculous I, number. I, and I can tell you that there is probably a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of percentage of people that visit Yellowstone today that had that have no idea of what that battle was. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Or, or, or uh, that are currently now unbeknownst to them are very grateful that there's not a railroad going right through Yellowstone right. to be able to kind of preserve what it is. Right. So if I can read one more chapter just because sure. yeah. Randy led, led it right to it. or cha- yeah. Not chapter, but <laughs> through, through journalism, Grinnell bridged the gap between abstract knowledge of academia and the practical knowledge that shapes the world events. He learned the power of the pen and forest and streamed helped to mobilize sportsmen as the nation's first national constituency for wildlife. He broadened his constituency through the creation of the auto Audubon Society, another factor that a lot of people would be surprised as to what he had done, but an ode to his boyhood boyhood tutor as much as her artist husband. When the railroad and real estate lobbies proved more powerful than public opinion, Grinnell created a lobby. Propelled by Roosevelt and Grinnell, the Boone and Crockett Club became the first national lobby to fight for conservation. Boone and Crockett Boone and Crockett helped win the battle for the soul of Yellowstone Park, for the for a new West in which wild places and wildlife would be revered, and on to the single and on to the single rock of Yellowstone would be the buffalo saved. Wow, that's if you get a chance, folks, go and buy that book. Or but you got it on your Kindle, right? I got it on my Kindle because is I it on Audible? I, li- I listen to it. Is it on you Audible, got it on yeah. Audible, Marcus? Yeah. It if you hunt, I I think you owe it to yourself to understand the history of how hunters built the conservation ethic. There, there's no other way around it. Every, like Punky, everyone who goes back and writes about this period of history and how did this happen? It was a group of hunters who 
formalize their their power through the establishment of the Boone and Crockett Club. The Boone and Crockett Club gave us the Antiquities Act, gave us the Lacey Act. Gave, I mean, all of the important uh, conservation legislation in this country happened because the Boone and Crockett Club. And today, most hunters think of the Boone and Crockett Club as some record-keeping system. Right. Mm-hmm. And even today, they are so influential, quiet but influential. I'm, I'm a big supporter of the Boone and Crockett Club for all their conservation work, all their advocacy. And I, I wish that more hunters would understand that history because if we don't know it, how, how how do we tell that story if, mm-hmm. if we don't know our own story? And so I, that is where my passion for bison really got started is Schultz to Grinnell and just knowing that if it wasn't for George Bird Grinnell, there probably would not be free range bison left on the North American continent. Mm-hmm. He just, mm-hmm. he made it his life's work. Can you imagine not having such a magnificent creature oh. around? I mean, if just looking at the size of that noggin and it's just <laughs> majestic. I mean, it's so yeah. amazing, yeah. these things. And all yeah. they represent. Can't imagine if they weren't here. Yeah. To me, they represent so much about America, mm-hmm. American history. Our mistakes, I'll, our corrections. It, exactly. That's what I was going to say, right? Some of our ugliest parts, the bison mm-hmm. are part of that. Uh, you know, how we treated the tribal groups of the plains. And we purposefully had the government go out and depopulate the bison mm-hmm. so that these native tribes would starve. They, they, their cultures would collapse. It, so there's a lot of... There's so much more beyond the conservation history right. of bison. It's, yeah. it's really it's an ugly it's part of a, our it's country. Big, the, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a huge compo- a good per- component of of our you know, establishment of the West. Yeah. And, um, and, and from what spawned that and how we had, how we had moved West and wanting to put a, a railroad through Yellowstone and those thoughts of, you know, what, what drove that, that ethic of, of Roosevelt to set aside so much of mm-hmm. this, of this land to use it and to, you know, to be used in perpetuity right. for, for all, for all Americans, not just the wildlife and the, and the landscapes and all, all this componentry that kind of comes with it, I think is, uh, it's, it's such a, and the battle continues today oh, for, yeah, right. for, That's for wild thing. lands and there's got to be people and organizations that are powerful enough and influential enough to, to make it stay as much this way as we can. Yeah. Or even increase. I mean, that's the thing. If you think about what fraction of their historic habitat do we actually have bison on now? It's just like, of all the species that were taken down and then brought back, (laughs) bison are the, you know, this, the very narrowest majority, you know, they, they just, hardly any left when you, in the scheme of things. Right. But, I mean, with our culture and the way society works today, there's no way we can even cover a fraction of their no. historic habitat, but these little isolated populations are really cool. There's mm. probably, there's got to be more cool. room on the yeah. landscape for stuff like this. I got I got to hunt. I was out this earlier this year, I was hunting the sand hills in Nebraska. Uh-huh. And all I could think about was, I, I mean, you look at that country, I'm like, this this feels like what bison country should have been right. in the late 1800s. Yeah. And and what was the story here? And I, I just still don't know it. I need, I want to research it more yeah. to try and gain an understanding of that. I was like, is there room to be, potentially bring them out here back on these sand hills? And certainly there's going to be conflicting interests in Northeast Montana certainly has their yeah. their challenges with what they're trying to do out there with, with Custer and APR. And um, But it's it's interesting that, you know, when we talk about you know the these these species and how some just get so much more attention than than right. others and i think you know bison is one of those that i think i i'd classify a bison as a charismatic megafauna oh. i mean I don't, oh, yeah. I don't, if there is a such thing as a charismatic megafauna bison is one of them but they don't they don't get uh they don't get the attention that i that i think they deserve and there's still a lot of good things going on with them mm-hmm. I, you know it's not that it's all doom and gloom right. or anything but i think we could we could be doing a, a lot more and those are going to be tough battles right it's yeah. Yeah. It's there's there's going to be interests that are going to it's it's going to encroach on somebody or cause 
somebody some consternation or it potentially impacts somebody to put them out in, into more more places. And we see that with all these species. Right. We see that with wild sheep. We see that with with so many with so many different animals. But you have to make conservation a, a priority. Yeah. You have to you have to let your 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 representatives know that it's a priority that you are a hunter or not. I don't, it doesn't, it, you don't have to be a hunter, but to let them know that it, it's a priority for you. You know, we talked about that, you know, they created Yellowstone, but they didn't allocate any budget to do anything with it. Well, we, we still, you know, a lot of people, we talk about some of the, the federal land management challenges today. What's mm-hmm. one of the biggest challenges, particularly with the Forest Service, there's no budget to right. do any management work. It's all firefighting work. Right. So it's, it, we're still dealing with budgetary issues. Those won't ever go away. Right. It's just about, it's just about making sure that you're communicating and making things that, you know, what you want a priority to be over, over other things. Yeah. Well, uh, bison politics, we live in the center of it in Montana mm-hmm. because we have the, the Yellowstone stone herd has brucellosis because back in the day, Yellowstone had its own cattle herd for milk and other products and food source for the employees of the park. Mm-hmm. Well, back in that time, nobody knew what brucellosis was. So most people believe that's how the bison of Yellowstone got infected with brucellosis. I can't say that for sure. You read it in enough places from smart people, you think, well, that's probably the case. Um, But the politics of bison expansion, at least in Montana and Wyoming, is so convoluted, it doesn't have to be that convoluted. So an example is in Montana, and I had this happen to one of our CPA clients, if you're an ag producer outside of Yellowstone National Park and your herd becomes infected and you have a positive. I'm trying to remember, I don't know if it's one positive, I think it's a second positive that you get placed under quarantine. In other words, you cannot sell any of your animals for a year. Well, if you can imagine, if you're a cattle rancher and you have 300 animals that you can't say, you can't generate a penny of revenue that year, but you got to continue to run an operation and feed 300 animals. And some people would say, well, just, you know, start over, you know, sell them and start over. Well, it's not that easy. You've worked generations to build whatever bloodlines you have in your cattle. And, and it doesn't have to be that way. The reason it's that way is, the rules by the APHIS, the Animal, Plant, and Health Inspection Service, make it extremely financial. Uh, all of the financial burden gets placed on the operator. So if I'm a cattle producer and I love wildlife, I'm in this conundrum. I want them there in the winter. I want them to survive also. But if an elk or a bison infects my, my cattle... And it affects your livelihood. Yeah. 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 Why do we have some uh, rules that are that stupid? Well, the reason we have rules that are that stupid is because of the political machine in which we operate in. It's been tried to be changed many times, never can get it changed. And so it's to expand bison, when you were talking about other stakeholders, JR, other folks who would be uh, affected, it's just going to have to take an effort where every group says, I'm not, it's not going to be all my way. Too many times we try to solve these problems by someone saying, I've got the idea for everybody. No compromise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, our country has evolved in a certain way. And if we aren't going to listen to the concerns of those who are going to bear or currently bear most of the burden of bison presence, we're not going to get any further. And it's, it's unfortunate I mean, here, this Henry herd, uh, part of what they've done is I think Division of Wildlife Resources here in Utah somehow has negotiated or traded or done something with the AUMs of forage here in the Henrys. An AUM is an animal unit month. In other words, how much forage a cow-calf pair eats in a month? I got that right, Marcus? Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> uh, he, he's always Actually, my resident expert. That was like a I, freshman class, like a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> and he doesn't have internet. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have any internet. To confirm or deny. <laughs> but there's there's so many AUMs that the let's say this mountain range can produce, and how much is going to be allocated to public land grazing for livestock versus how much for wildlife, like 
bison. And so to expand this herd, they've had to work with those people who had the historic grazing allotments. And exactly how they did that, I don't know, but I know it was a negotiation and, and years and years of, of the wildlife agency working with the local grazing rights holders. And now I think they their target here is about 450 bison in the Henry's herd. And they use hunting as their only management tool here. It is the, they don't come in like they do outside Yellowstone, yeah. capture and slaughter. They use hunting as the only mechanism here. And so I, I couldn't believe I drew the tag. I, I was, <laughs> uh, you, you could have, if you would have seen the look on my face, it would be the definition of surprise followed by the definition of exhilaration. And we're all glad you drew it. <laughs> yeah. Do you do you know um, if Utah DNR or um, DWR DWR they call it um, uh, do you know how they earmark their like are the bison tag dollars specifically allocated towards bison or does it go into a pool of of wildlife budget? I don't know that. I'd be curious. Yeah. In California specifically, like big game tags are so the fees, the license fees and and um, and tag fees for big game must go into what's called the big game management account, okay. right? And so they're specifically allocated back towards towards pronghorn, elk, deer, um, and bear, black bear, and and, uh, and and bighorn sheep, and so I'd, I'd be curious to, to know if that if these dollars that are coming here and, and spent uh, on bison again, there's not there's not really a ton of tags. There was twenty right. archery tags, twenty and archery maybe tags, and significantly maybe. less on the rifle because because of the yeah potential I, for success. You have information so, on that right yeah. in the comments below. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the, well, they have uh, two rifle seasons here, an early and a late. So I think the early is in November and the late's in December, and then they have two cow bison hunts in December. So I, I'm not sure how many tags are given away in a year, but when you think about it, only 10% of those go to non-residents. So the pool of money from bison tags... It's pretty small. Pretty small. Yeah, pretty Wouldn't, small. It, they'd have to augment the bison program significantly yeah. from funds from other sources, I would yeah, think. Yeah, I'm guessing it's not a standalone, but I'd be just curious if, if, if those dollars are specifically allocated back to bison or if it's got to go into some sort of pool and then... Yeah, and it saves pool, and the then budget a, by using hunters because you don't have the dollars and resources expended to round them up and slaughter and things like that. So it makes more sense to, to use, hunting, use hunters. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, in Montana, we use hunting to some degree. Uh, there's an allocation of opportunity between the non-tribe hunters and the tribal hunters. The tribes get the overwhelming majority of opportunity and the, the non-tribal members uh, get a, I, I can't remember that's 90-10 split or what, but it's, it's a signif significantly weighed towards the tribal hunters. But even at that, uh, Yellowstone tries to keep their numbers around 3,000 to 3,500, and right now they're pushing 5,000. So they yeah. round them up when they come out in Gardner, Montana, and they slaughter a bunch of them and ship them and uh, do whatever. They have a hard time shipping them, though, because they're known to be infected with brucellosis. Nobody wants them. Nobody wants them. So it's uh, it's definitely a controversy in our part of the world. And, and it's a way different hunt. I had that Montana tag. When that group of bison opening morning came out of the park, I could have shot one in the parking lot. And if you watch that episode, you see that I didn't. We chased them down <laughs> into the roadless area, uh, or non-motorized, and I guess roadless and non-motorized area, which made for a way better hunt until you tip one over. Yeah. <laughs> and it's 20 below, and you're in and you 30 say, I wish inches I had of snow. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so that this hunt here on the Henry's was way, way more of a hunt. I have, I had a Wyoming cow tag hunt, a uh, cow bison hunt, and that was a little bit of a circus also because what happens is you're hunting the bison that come out of Grand Teton National Park and they come onto the uh, National Elk Refuge you know, outside of Jackson. And there's hunters waiting for them and when they come out, boom, 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 they shoot a few of them and whoop, they run right back into the park. <laughs> so here, there's no park. These bison, right. they're, they're going wherever they want to go. And it's the same thing with Montana, too. It's, uh, it's all they're just right. waiting for them to come out of those park boundaries, yeah. which is just 
just it makes for a it's 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 yeah a, a challenging situation and yeah. it's just not a no I, but if you cherish the food bison provide mm-hmm. to the degree i do uh i'll go anywhere yeah i, I apply for bison in every state that has a hunt other than arizona and Arizona, I don't just because of the non-resident tag is five or six thousand dollars. Cheers that back I don't know. After, after having that tenderloin last night, yeah. that might be. <laughs> 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 yeah, we got to get to all the foods we've eaten since we've been here. I it's know. Now, just yeah. cutting that thing up, I, th- I feel like we need to talk about that a little bit. That was yeah. How big the cuts of meat are? What like pieces of meat you get on that compared yeah. to if other animals? It's crazy. And quartered other animals. It's it's not the same it, no. it's overwhelming how the other animals little muscle groups that you don't yeah. even think about because they're too small to even mess with yeah. here they're a full cut of meat yeah and they're gonna like they're they're yeah they're so tiny like on another animal like they're gonna they're gonna dry out and get that rind by the time you trim it down like there's literally nothing left right, right. i mean here on a bison like we were i mean and we had some we had some caribou i pastrami to caribou brisket and brought some and i mean it's like it's like an, a half inch, maybe three quarters of an inch <laughs> thick, and a bison's like I mean, it's more classically like a like off a cow's yeah. big, beautiful, thick breast cut of. It's just gorgeous. I mean, think things probably things probably ten pounds yeah. <laughs> one side of it, yeah. and, and so the the cuts off everything are just so so cool because they're just everything is just so much more so much so much bigger and and meatier and yeah. so it's a really cool perspective. Yeah. I was to be learning able to see more that. cuts while y'all were, you know, processing, you know, uh, quartering it and stuff. That yeah, because if I shoot a deer, that's not a piece I get. You know, I. I don't even know what that is. Yeah. You get a whole, whole so you meal can, of cheek meat. Now you can meat. tell me, oh, well, this is, you know, and is JR crazy. goes into a thesis on, you know, what, <laughs> the different way, you know, he becomes Charlie Brown's teacher to me after a little while because <laughs> it's all over my head and I don't get it. But I'm like, wow, okay, I'm glad we got this bison so I can figure this out. You know, I didn't yeah. figure it out. Well, that, but. Was, that was really cool to see all the different things you grabbed other than just the meat, too. Yeah. JR mm-hmm. was grabbing like the trachea and then the tendons and stuff to make dog treats out of. And this we, is cool. I the, never thought about that. Liver, I don't have a dog. The so. heart, the trachea, the tongue, you kidneys, got the kidneys, cheek the, meat, cheek <laughs> yeah. meat, testicles, testicles. testicles. Mm-hmm. We ate those last those night. Are delicious. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then just the there's so many other pieces that. Oh, I'm not going to trim that little piece yeah. off. It, it, mm-hmm. By the time it, like Jr. said, by the time it dries, it's going to be nothing. Well, this, mm-hmm. you trim it off and it weighs two pounds. Yeah, yeah that hanger steak or whatever, it was internal. Yeah. That yeah. was a huge chunk of meat. Yeah. That Everything liver just... looked like a prop for an anatomy class. I mean, it was so <laughs> big. It was just like, oh, good Lord. <laughs> yeah. And then, I mean, just the flank steaks. You the heart, the, yeah. The size and the yeah. thickness. The and heart the, was like a pumpkin. <laughs> yeah, and the the tenderloins that we, the, oh, that we man. cut out, the one we ate last night, was just dimension wise, it looks like an elk backstrap. Yeah, mm-hmm. it just yeah, and man, that was good. Ho ho ho, that was good. So, anybody who gets a chance, I hope you'll advocate for bison. I hope you'll learn about their history and what they mean to conservation in America. And I hope you'll apply and you'll call me that I can come and share some of whatever you take. <laughs> have llamas, Absolutely. we'll travel. Yeah. If you have a bison tag. But so we've been we we you're you're right, Ray. We can't quit or leave the audience without explaining to them what kind of a cook JR is and what an assortment of wild game we have had or will have in this camp for meals. We, JR talked about his uh, caribou pastrami. Mm-hmm. That came from where? Uh, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. That you took last year? Last year. Mm-hmm. We were. Wow. Marcus has been passing around his mule deer jerky. Yep. And that came from where? Montana. Montana. He, some place not to be told. Central. Elk chili in there. Central the, Montana. From the Elka shop. Okay. Two weeks ago in Colorado. Yeah, so we got elk chili, and then where else do we have elk? I, I brought some oh. elk backstrap from Wyoming and from Montana. Okay, from one from last Wyoming from last year, Montana this year. So we already talked about the bison. Uh, you brought a doll sheep roast from Alaska. 
Yeah. Yep. And then we already talked about JR's salmon that he caught from the Great Pacific. The original mm-hmm. plan was for surf and turf that yeah, night. Yeah, that was the original <laughs> plan. <laughs> we just had the surf. We, we had the surf because I didn't the next fulfill day we got the turf, turf part. And then I brought some moose, the, some moose burger that my son had shot last year in Montana. I think all these have come off public land, if I recall correctly. Is the ocean considered public land? I would consider, I think yeah. so. <laughs> uh, I have some antelope chops, uh, and uh, I don't know if I brought any antelope burger, but Randy yesterday... Said he I, was inspired by JR, and he's going to make the most simple chops, and if we don't like it, he'll eat right. all of it. Yep, that's what I've said. Since JR's cooked the last two nights, I'm, I feel both guilty and inspired so tonight I'm cooking those antelope chops as simple as possible, and I'm hoping nobody likes them because then that's just more for me. I've already established it's, I just eat it, them to be polite, and it, I'm so polite I eat seconds because <laughs> I don't want to offend anyone. You're so such a polite I'm, guy, I'm right? a giver like that. It's, it's pretty hard to screw up to screw up cooking antelope unless uh, you know unless you you know you shot it at eight in the morning and threw it in the back of your your line X lined pickup truck and drove around in eighty degree weather all day while you were trying to trying to fill the rest of your four tags in your pocket. I think he's just. I think that's even why you antelope, can do it, Randy. That's a common antelope originally from <laughs> that because that of that. <laughs> yeah. And then yesterday we polished off a package of those meat sticks I had that were the antelope ones. Now I have two remaining packages that are Montana whitetail that I shot down on the Custer National Forest last year. Man, we For, sound like carnivores. How many uh, species is Let's that? See, mule deer, whitetail, salmon, doll sheep antelope, bison, elk, caribou, moose, eight. Man, I wish I wish I would have been thinking because I got my buddy's blacktail in my fridge, in my freezer. Mm. I could have brought a piece of blacktail and we could have had it. We could have had a, a you know a trifecta of trifecta deer. Deer. Oh yeah, we're really missing out. <laughs> 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 just eight other things. I mean, uh, not only uh, epic hunt, but just to have that many different. Yeah. You know, well, and to have game. A, to have a guy who's as talented as it at it as Jr. is is just super use a lot helpful. of garlic. That's all it is. <laughs> yeah, I'll make them real hungry. <laughs> well, I'm curious if Marcus and Dan have any observations that we've missed. Of no, I mean that was uh, it was super fun to be a part of this hunt, and I apologize for my my cough, you're, which you're is hacking. definitely a factor in that first stock not working. I just could I don't not. Think so keep quiet you really need I'm to switch sniffle to it. like it it's just yeah this is a bad deal yeah. but you I think it worked out great because that allowed me to go on both epic stocks one that resulted yeah. in a down bison so yeah. thank you I'm thinking. a little sad about that although it was it's really cool to watch from a distance too like yeah. and, and get that that second angle the different camera angle yeah. it'll be cool to cut back and forth between those that's how it all comes together. So when I did shoot the one, did you guys actually see the release and everything, or did you just? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I didn't know if you guys thought, oh, he let down or mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah, no, we're, no, we, we knew. were far closer front than than the night before. I could I could tell you <laughs> the night the the night before, but it was hard to tell whether or not you released or not. But I think yeah. it was easier. You could see when you let down, and but you could it was it was pretty clear. Huh. What a remarkable experience to get to come and do this on public land and what a country. I say that all the time. I, I, I don't mean it jokingly either. I I cannot believe that I live in a place where the average American gets to be a hunter. That's, yeah. that's not the case in the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, Any, just, anybody can do it and it, it's you just have to you have to figure it out for yourself you have to maybe you come from a hunting background maybe you don't there are so many people today that are coming into hunting for uh, you know we talk about all this food they're coming into it for food purposes and and we know that and that's that it's a it's a critical message uh, you know we talked on two of the really big things uh, that are so critical to the to the future and to the acceptance of hunting is that everyone understands that there's a conservation element to it what our dollars go to 
um, and that we are concerned more for the species uh, for long long terms. And of course, people throw out, oh, you just want to shoot, you know, you just want to shoot, you just want animals because you can shoot them. And that's that's not the case at all because it goes into, for me, it's it's a really a critical element of of feeding me and yeah. feeding my friends and feeding my family and not just feeding it, but it's that communal aspect. We we invite people over into our home to be able to share these meals and share those experiences and 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 talk about things, right? So we're not, you know, as much as I, you know, use social media and Facebook and Instagram and whatever, it's it's about inviting people in and sitting down over a table and hashing out ideas and maybe you don't agree cuz you know, everybody wants to talk like, "Oh, we always have, we know we we know we have more in common than than, you know, but people just get so fired up on social media, but we even even I do, and I try and say that, and I you know try and lead by example. But then I get fired up on social media sometimes. I'm like, you got to remember that you're you're not going to win that battle. It's it's about you know it's, it, that that sharing aspect of it and having people close to you and communicating with people and and you know it's it's such a great experience that that hunting is from you know not the experience in the woods, but then everything everything downstream at home and from all those moments that every time you open that freezer and pull out a piece of meat and what's that meal going to be? Who's it going to be with? What are you going to talk about? What are you, um, yeah. you know, it's a lot better than, you know, and I, I think it was, I think I heard it on a Ranella podcast or something, but it's a lot better than going to the, the murder counter at the supermarket. <laughs> you know, there's no story there. It's, 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 you know, and well, I, not that I don't eat commercial meat. I, I do occasionally, yeah. occasionally, but it's a, it's, it's fun to be able to have a, have a story with a meal. Yeah. And I shared with you guys last night over the campfire, I was just kind of overwhelmed by the situation because uh, due to the circumstances in my life, it's been five years since I've been hunting. And then some buddies from the army had invited me and I went and did an elk hunt and got my first elk with a bow and and just coming out here doing this the camaraderie the i mean it doesn't just feed your body it feeds your soul i mean yeah. it feeds your soul and it in in ways that no other things can when yeah. you're out in nature and you're around people that are good people most hunters are good people uh seems like but it, it is just something that you can't find other ways and, and it just fed my soul so it was again to randy and everybody that just let me tag along it was such a great thing for me cool well i appreciate you being here ray i appreciate your service all you've done and i i don't take it lightly when i think about how it is that the united states has the greatest conservation story and i think it's because we have made sure that people could connect themselves to the land and the wildlife and the food and all the culture and, and things that comes from it. And if we ever let that circle b get broken, mm -hmm. re reconnecting that circle is nearly impossible. And that's why well, you talk about the food sharing, JR, or, you know, whatever it is, Ray, you're talking about going with some army buddies who you reconnected again those are parts of that circle that uh, it, it, until you do it and, and understand it and participate in it, it's, it's hard for people who aren't part of it or who haven't participated in it to really understand it until they go and get their own food or go and share a camp or you know, what, whatever it is. Just get away from the noise of life. I mean, I <laughs> think I'm the only one that didn't have a single speck a signal the entire time i just stay in airplane that's mode why you look to, so happy yeah yeah <laughs> it, and it's amazing it, it just is peace it's peaceful you know and yeah. it's, it's hard work but it's good hard work that when you're tired at the end of the day you feel good about it and you feel peaceful and yeah you got to go back to life but yeah it's good to take some time out and do that for sure yeah. i think there's an element of 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 the hunt 
that, well, number one, we know that being out in nature is very healthy for us. That's mm-hmm. been, we've scientifically proven that, that, yeah. that often, and some people are just going to that as a prescription to spend time, whether it's a local city park or something, just getting outside and breathing and, um, and, and listening to, but you know, and especially on a hunt, it's, it's hard work and you, by the end of it, whatever it is, and you know, some hunts are easier than others, but you might be physically exhausted, but spiritually you just feel rejuvenated, right? It, it is, it is is something that is it's it's very it's it's very rewarding to put in this effort for something that you know that will that will that will feed you and your friends and something that you can look back upon it's it's i think it's extremely healthy I mean, my wife tells me when i come back from from hunts and she goes on many with me but when i come back she's like you she's like you 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 reconnect mm-hmm. you you're there's something that that it's it's really good for you when you go out and then you yeah. come back because you 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 come back a little bit of a different person you've got that recharge you know your batteries are topped off the tanks topped off again and you're and you're ready to go and so i think that's that's really critical and maybe that's just seeing the wildlife or the hunt or whatever i think i heard shane mahoney say one time of you know if there if there was no wildlife that yeah we'll continue on as a as a as a species but we will die spiritually yeah we will we have evolved over millennia with wildlife and and to be have that experience with them it's it's it is critical to our you know to our to our species because we've evolved together yeah, I know. Just like the, you know, the cheetah, the cheetah and the gazelle, or whatever. All these species throughout throughout the globe evolved with with one another, and we're just as much as part of that. And we sometimes may have a um, a heavy handed influence into those species, into whether or not we they, um, you know, they flourish or or they don't um, because of what we've done through in the industrial era. But it's critical that we that we prioritize that because being able to experience wildlife is 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 so important for our soul. And a lot of people have maybe have lost that connection or. Maybe they have it, but they just need to, you know, flip the switch again because, um, you know, to get out and experience. Well, in America, without public lands for people like the five of us to come mm-hmm. and do what we just did, is not the America that's part of my dream and my vision. Mm-hmm. I just, I just feel so lucky to live in this country and it's America so, so much. I mean, Ray, you've seen some of the toughest places in the world. And if anyone knows how great America is by relative perspective, it would be you. It's not perfect, but it's the greatest country in the world. Yeah. Well, we uh, we got some more work to do before we can head home. If we can head home tomorrow, I don't know. The way it snowed, we might need to chain up just to <laughs> get down to right down to the state highway here. Yeah. Of course, they said that they can't cross that creek today because of all the moisture. So We got food. We got food. We got food. We got, we got firewood. Ray went out and got about four cords of firewood this morning, so we can have one hell of a big fire. With the help of Dan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, Dan was with him. <clears throat> and uh, He was filming me loading it in the truck. No. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, sorry, I'm the cameraman. I got to get footage of this. <laughs> That's what I was yesterday. I'm like, nobody you... wants to watch firewood gathering. <laughs> Hunters and gatherers. Uh, Hunters. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, this is a shameless plug, but I know the question, it's already come up a million times, of what I used on this bison hunt. And there is another place where you can use promo code Randy. Oh. <laughs> Bone Broadheads. Mm. So Jared, uh, he reached out to me and he sent them to me last year. They're a two blade, just, just really, uh, I mean, for whatever reason, they, eh, I don't understand the physics of it, but they shoot so well out of my setup. Unbelievable. So I was using 125 grain bone broadhead. And if you go out there and use promo code Randy. R-A-N-D-Y. R-A-N-D-Y. Uh, he's got some special things going on there. So go to bone broadheads, Google it, and go there. And I did beef up my whole setup for this hunt. Uh, my total arrow, broadhead, everything combined was pushing right about 500 grains. Uh, and because I've got some shoulder and wrist issues. I've never been an 80 pound, 75 pound draw weight guy. I'm just 60 pounds on my Botech realm. And 
it it would have been a complete pass through if it hadn't hit that off shoulder. I'm sure it would have, but yeah. I guess it goes to prove that a really sharp broadhead that can chisel and cut through bone and meat can do an awful lot of damage to a really big animal if you put it in the right place. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be going 400 feet per second. I think I'm at, when I chronoed mine, I think I'm, with that setup, I'm going right at about 250, 252 feet per second, which when you have limited talent like I do, you need the best equipment you can find. So that's the shameless plug for this podcast. Well, it, it certainly it certainly did its work. I mean, yeah. you know, what, seven, eight minutes or, or whatever, but, you know, well-placed well placed shot into the vitals with with good equipment. Whether Bouncing it's a, off the whether it's a quality bullet or a quality bullet or a, or a quality broadhead. Yeah. Make sure they can do the job yeah. when they get there. Well, I hope one of you guys draw this tag some year. I'd really like to come back. It's once in a lifetime, so I'm one and done. So if it takes me as long when I'm 69, I'll be out here. <laughs> I tell you what, Ray, if you draw that 69 and I'm still kicking, mm -hmm. I'll bring a troop of guys with. Somehow we'll get it done. Somebody will push my off-road wheelchair up there close enough. <laughs> and, I'll, <laughs> and I'll get her done. Well, hopefully JR's still cooking at that time. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we'll bring his son out. He'll his just son have will to be a protege at that Metamucil time. in or something else. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to figure out if, it can, if I can put him in and put him in, in Utah yet. So. There you go. Yeah. Well, I think we've kept the audience long enough, guys. I can't thank you enough. What a remarkable experience. Every time a plate of bison passes across my table, I'll think about the four guys who joined me on this hunt and think about, darn, I hope it's not so long before the four of us get to do the next hunt, so, yeah. which is what hunting is all about. When I, you think about that, I, you know, it's like I, when I... Pastrami that caribou brisket. I, I, I thought about when's the next time I'm going to have pastrami caribou brisket. Yeah. You know, will I? Yeah. Maybe I don't. But they, you know? Ray, Ray made a really cool observation when you were talking about that caribou pastrami. I started asking you, can you shoot ptarmigan up on, on that floor? Yeah. yeah. And within five minutes... I grilled you so hard about the logistics and you got all excited sharing them with Marcus and Dan and I. Ray says, is that how these new ideas come up? You hear this from someone? And I'm like, yeah. Because <laughs> you said there was a supplier that offered you, hey, could you use this uh, mm -hmm. boat, you know, in a deal? And then that came up and yeah. I could tell, I could see the wheels, smoke coming out of his ears. I'm like, this is how it happens, isn't it? You know, you're out talking, somebody had offered this, somebody Put me on talks a plane about to that. Fairbanks, let's and do then it. he gets yeah. all excited. You could tell he's getting all giddy already, seeing the, <laughs> seeing the hunt happen. I'm like, can I go? Yeah. <laughs> I'll paddle. There you I'll, go. No, it's... Uh, we're always planning the next adventure, which is what gives you reason to wake up in the morning and go stay in shape all year long and uh, just stay at it, be an advocate for it, and live the life. So. Where's that Where's that next special place that you get to go discover? That's right. Where is it? Where? Where's that point on the map? Where's, you know, is it going to be circumstance is it going to be a uh you know a, a luck of the tag draw that brings you some special place i mean it, you, don't, you don't know and that's that's all that's all part of the adventure that's all that's all part of it and thinking yeah. about that and oh, the anticipation the planning and everything well folks thanks for listening until the next time i hope you go out and share some time with great family and friends fill your freezer and have a good time Thanks for listening.